Live. Yo, 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 yo. Welcome to another episode of the Joe Zone Podcast. A super special episode, actually, of the Joe Zone Podcast. Um, yo, I, I've been wanting to have this guy on for a super long time. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Alfred Adrian, how's it going? Hello, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. It's lucky to be in Cape Town. Yeah, man. It's lovely. Yeah, so so yeah, like I said before, this I've been wanting to have you on for quite a while, and it's a, a lot of what we spoke about before the yeah. just before this podcast is sure. like you you got vlogs, you there's a marketing aspect to the side of your comedy, mm. you're a comedian, mm -hmm. you you're a family man, you all these things that that I can relate to, like mm -hmm. so that's why I really wanted to have you on. Yeah, and I appreciate that. You, but your your start is very different different to mine now. Mm. <laughs> you started in a in a small town, Anki. Yeah, I'm from, listen, I am from Anki. It's so yeah. much part of, it's part of my DNA. It's what I, I just, I just came back. I just visited my parents there. Yeah. I'm from a small town. And I think that a lot of the time, uh, growing up, I once used to tease me a lot about, I just a plasnar. Easy. And I turned that thing and I went, no, so I'm a plasnar. That's great. I'm a plasnar and I, 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 I take and I run with it. And it's been like a differentiating thing. I'm very proud of being from a small town. So when I looked up Anki on a, on a map actually today and I checked like, where is this place? Because yeah. I didn't know. So it's yeah. like in the Eastern Cape, am I right? Yeah. right? Yeah. And it's close to Jeffrey's Bay. Really it's like close, yeah. over here. Yeah. And then, uh, um, uh, Car I must, uh, uh, I must so pronounce it the right P-E, but I must pronounce it Kabeja. Kabeja, there yeah. we go, it's over here. So yeah. um, I also heard like you spent a lot of time obviously going to these other cities. So is that where you, you got like made fun of or something like that? Yeah, you know? no, listen, I went to high school in Port Elizabeth because- Okay, so you went to high school yes. in P-E. So my parents are from Anki, they uh. still live there. We had a little supermarket there, like okay. a bubby. You know, supermarket is a very, you know, liberal thing to say about what we had. We had a bubby, right? <laughs> corner shop. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we had a corner shop and my mother was a teacher there. And, but there wasn't a good high school there. And my parents were like, listen, we want a little bit better for you. So they sent me to, because uh, the high school just started. Sure, so this, that town was so small that there was there definitely wasn't, no a, a decent was, high school. Yeah, no, there was no high school. There was no, high, no school. high school. It started the year, my final year. So my parents were like, listen, we're not sending you to this brand new high school across the road. Mm. They must figure themselves out a bit first, but they then sent me to Port Elizabeth where I stayed with my grand and my grandfather. Because okay. they lived across the road from a uh, then decent high school. Okay. Yeah. So, so, to, so I went to high school in Port Elizabeth. Then I got. Is out that with a plasnar like that? Oh, my friend, we buy some inside for me plasnar. <laughs> <laughs> Every day that was a hey, blast there, hunky there. Was, oh. And obviously you had to no, have school. like a, 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 a I was, I wasn't. The, didn't I, you have like a shoot bag? Like? My friend, listen, let me tell you something. I am very, I'm not, I hate teasing people. Now, this is something that comedians find, people find weird because comedians, I just yeah. said this to Jason Goliath. I said the thing I hate the most about that culture that they celebrate so much because Jason and him always about guarrying each other. That yeah, yeah. Job. I say, I hate teasing. I hate it. I hate being teased and I don't like this. So roasts, any roast I've ever been offered. I've been offered Comedy Central roast positions. No thanks. Mm. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about you and hurt you on stage. It's not who I am. And, and when you say something about my wife or my kid, you're going to see in my face, I'm unhappy. Oh. So I, I stay away from it. So okay. I never was a big teaser. So I just have to take it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, but you took it and then you, how did you, is that, no, you, you must have been like, sort of like a, Everyone, everyone, you know, high school. You just get water teased, for back, uh, yeah. you get teased, you, it, it shapes you. You know what I mean? You, uh, you, 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 after a while they get tired of it and then move to the next guy. I think everybody's um, uh, reaction towards teasing is different. Like, mm. well, a lot of people's reaction towards teasing is different because my reaction is like totally different to yours. Yeah. And that's maybe how it sculpted me to yeah, be yeah. how I am. And yeah. maybe, I, I don't know, in a lot of ways, I think like teasing or, or how people, what people thought of you when you, ah, you're not going to amount to shit yeah. or something yeah, like yeah. that. Sometimes that can fuel you to, yeah. to, to, to push you to be Ab better, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, or try to be at least better. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Because I'm so sensitive about that. Like, no, it's not that I'm sensitive. I mean, I could take a joke. You can make fun of me. I don't mind. It's that I just don't understand why. I've seen people get killed because of teasing. <laughs> you know that. You've seen it. Yeah. In our culture, far. it's not good. It's not a good thing. Our egos are fragile. We come from difficult upbringings. It's a violent 
you know, it, it can turn violent. I had two friends, two friends that I went to primary school with, and people in Anki will know what I'm talking about. They teased each other at a tavern. They know each other from some way. The one hit the other one with a brandering duet. Yes. The next day, the other guy drank poison, teasing. So I'm like, we're too fragile for these things. You know what I mean? And also, why is a 40-year-old man teasing another 40-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that on is, stage in front. Now, many women no proud for me, ma. I go, on stage in front. Where we're coming? Well, you you don't you don't tease a person. You tease like a idea sometimes. No, sometimes no. But the facts are, they tease you a person, not the idea. Yeah. So many it's times a difference. in those roast battles. Have you seen even the ones that you watch that are professionally done? I go, yo, yo, yo. Yeah, it's a bitchy not to like. Speak about the brass wife like that. <laughs> now you must stand there and smile. Hey, don't call Klaus. But he's gone. Yeah, it's it's not. I just I, it's not for me. I I, yeah. I respect people that do it and say thing. I enjoy watching people <laughs> do it, but uh, it's not for me. So you you went to high school right in PE, and then yeah. did you go to university as well in PE? I went to first. I had a stint at UCT. I got a full scholarship. Is it so you came to Cape Town? My friend, I in my new in my well the, the one man show I just finished, not the new one. I speak about that. I got I got a full scholarship to UCT. Shoo. Yeah, yeah. Marketing or something. Business science. Business, a business science. science. I, I got in to a business science uh, uh, UCT thing. And then, oh, yeah. Uh, business science at UCT. And then I, um, listen, it didn't go well. And it's not because I, and this is, I'd like to say that it, it's nice to say, look, nah, the party at my gefat, but the party didn't take me. The reality was that, For me, coming from PE Hanky, right, all of a sudden thrust into Cape Town. Like I must understand, I probably been to Cape Town twice that time in my life. By the age 18, I'd only been to Cape Town on holiday maybe once or twice. I didn't know the place. It's a it's a foreign idea to me. Now I'm at UCT, and the truth is, is that the school I went to public school, walking into business science first year, the, yeah. I was great at math. But the math in those rooms were different. I was looking around, going, "Is this the right paper?" It was rough. Yeah. So I, I didn't come here. I didn't party. I didn't sleep my days away. I failed. I just wasn't. I just wasn't trained up enough. There was guys next to me that I go, "This oh, this is the thing about private schooling and all that stuff." You go, "This oh, you're next to me. He's not. He's not smarter than me." I know it. I know just for a fact. More ex- he just comes from. He did A levels at school. Is that more did, experience, like? Yeah, he did, <clears throat> he did this math. He did varsity math in standard eight. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we did higher grade math. He did IEB math. Those papers are very different. Okay. So it took a lot of adjusting. Then I failed, got excluded, went back to the University of Port Elizabeth, and then I was like, okay, I need to dig deep, and then I managed to pass there. So I But didn't you when you when you came like to Cape Town? Wasn't it also like a, almost like is that even a culture shock? Is the right word? Yeah, like, I think so. I think it's the right <laughs> word. Like a culture shock and like uh, also like a I don't know awakening of like like whoa, this is a very bigger ex- world. <laughs> my bro, very exciting. Listen, you get here. I was very excited. I was actually a little nostalgic because Craig David was just here. That album came out in 2001 when I came to just Cape Town. Just when you came here. <laughs> and so I was very, very, it's a culture shock. Uh-huh. Man, for years it was a culture shock. Eh? Even when I finished here and I lived here for a year, I was at Varsity trying to pass. So I didn't really see Cape Town. And then when I came back here in my later years after moving to Joburg, then is when I started really enjoying Cape Town yeah. for the beauty and the culture and the people. I used to be terrified of coming to Cape Town to do stand up. Terrified. Like it was foreign people. Like this is now how the people love you. <laughs> now it's <laughs> my <laughs> what a what a difference. Huh? But, and I think maybe it's part of that because I I, I always used to come in and I go like yo, can I give me kind of like laugh? You know, these people are from like a different world than me. Because, mm. and then um, as time went on, I started going, no man, there's a, no, it's the same. It's it, And I became more comfortable, but it used to be a very difficult audience. Cape Town used to, I used to sell, um, you can, my wife and I was married, at, already just married. And I did, years ago, I did a, a one man show, excuse me, called Dating Life. Um, very few people probably have seen. Uh, it was on TV, but you know those things, no one ever sees it. Comedy Central, maybe. No, it was it was sold to multi choice, so they sold it on a multiple channel package, so they could air it in different places. I did an Afrikaans and English, but because the viewership is so low on those things, and they're not promoting the show, like 
I'm an unknown comic. It was just airing sometime at mm. 10 o'clock at night, you know. So, um, but when I came to do that show, yeah, and Joe, Joe Bug was my number one audience. I would sell a thousand tickets there over two weeks, and I was like, yo. Listen. When was that? How that long would ago? be 2017, 18. Not even that long ago. Okay. So I'd be, I, would be, I was already a professional comedian for about six years when I did the first one. I got a TV deal. It wasn't a great deal, but it was a TV deal. Mm. But trying to sell tickets in Cape Town, I had a 200 seat in Cape Town, 100 one night and 100 the next night. It was tooth and nail. Half the one night was my wife's family. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and like my family and friends, I used to struggle. Now, jump ahead a couple of years, it's the number one market for me. I, I, I cannot believe like the show that you have on the screen. So, yet. so I, I didn't want to go there yet, yeah. but no, no, let's no, go sure. there since we are there at this point. What was the, what was the, the change? What are the catalyst catalysts okay. for, for, for Cape Town to be such a, because oh, I mean, now you like almost like a Cape Town boy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I feel like, like, I'm almost a, like a Cape Town I'm, adopted you no, or something I, like I, that. I feel the love. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it was, I mean, we're talking about a whole lot. When I say I was nervous to come to Cape Town, I'm talking about 10 years, in terms of comedy, yeah. I'm talking about 10 years ago. Yeah. When I used to come and do Kurt's Club as an open spot, right? Yeah. Then I was like, because you're so nervous, you don't realize these are your people. They have the same cultural background as you, They, you know, mm. but you're so nervous because I'm from, you must remember, I'm from the farm. It's a far, plus lady. They call you plus now. That's how you see in yourself. It's, it's, like, it's in your head. So you walk out and you go, ooh, these people are not going to laugh. This is how they so, see me. You're so intimidated. It's Cape Town. Then you flop. It's not the jokes. It's you. And then as time goes by, you go, no, man. And then you start getting it right. And you fail your way into, and then all of a sudden, you know, I started becoming more confident and I'd be successful in Cape Town. But it, the, the, the success with, how popular I've become in Cape Town is jump 10 years ahead because people go, yeah, no, you're an overnight success. It's that classic thing. I did it 11 years before I was an overnight success. Mm. It was a consistent daily routine of writing and performing material and coming to Cape Town on my own dime, losing money out here, just working the clubs, working the clubs, working the clubs until I became comfortable. And then, you know, other things fell into place, like, you know, the vlogging and the stuff came up and then people sort of found me. And now I feel like it's my kitchen. You know what I mean? It's like, I feel like part of Cape Town. Uh, from my perspective, mm. I, I might be 100% wrong, but it's like, you always have this this mixture between English and Afrikaans. Yeah. And you probably always had it and stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. But like somehow, Cape Town has a massive market for Mingles. For, for Mingles, yeah, yeah, for Mingles. And somehow, I don't know if people saw you on the on the internet or something mm. like that. My, my mother-in-law yeah she's she's that that guy that crowd mm. she loves you she's like she's like oh we, we, we this guy she don't care about anybody else like yeah. okay she's yeah. mark so yeah. mark latrine because of yeah. auntie ball yeah. so so popular but besides that she don't know any other comic but yeah. mark and you uh, and, and i think it's because of that english africa and stuff like that and once you put it on vlogs yeah. people sh you people saw that person yeah Oh, this this guy yeah. speaks like this. Now yeah. they know, and now they want to. Hey, we need to buy tickets for this guy. So yeah. I, I might be wrong, but I, I almost I, think I, so I, the internet did did you some no, of course. a big a big help. Like I think I think yes, everything you said is right, but there are other nuances, I guess. Yeah, obviously play. you're working in the clubs, hundred percent to just, get to know the the, the custom, yeah, custom, the, the client. The, 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 listen, I think a lot of the stuff has um, got to do. I think there's, there's is, like you said, 100% right what you're saying, right? Um, by the way, English and Afrikaans is one language in my head. So I, I did the show in Afrikaans all the way up the garden route, and I will turn it into English and Marcel Bay. And it, it, that's not worries, doesn't worry me one bit. So my father is an English boy, my mother was an Afrikaans lady. I grew up Afrikaans, and my, my wife is, in, like, my life is very English. Yeah. So like this doesn't make in an Afrikaans product. It, yeah, it, 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 I've seen it. It's one, it's one color. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, that part of it. But I think a lot has to do with, yes, they discovered me on the internet. Yes, there's a consistency throughout. They know that I'm not, I, you can't fake it this long. So no. I, I was always about, I'm, I'm, I don't want, that's why I was never, I gave up on TV. I gave up on television. I gave up on ads. I didn't want that. 
the reason but you're working on rule yeah i'm working on rule and i'll tell you how that came <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go come, back to that we'll come i'll come back uh, i'll loop back to that the why i why i left tv is because every time you do tv stuff you have to do an ad or you play a character i always wanted to just be a stand up i hate acting i hate it i've done movies i'm someone else people don't remember you you know you you've become that person sometimes south africans are so intimately if you got a soapy people hate you when you're the villain i've got friends ervin <laughs> yeah, and yeah. me were, ervin and me are good friends and we were in movies together this practice is in the mall the aunties will slam on a sack so i go i've never wanted to play a character I never so i stopped trying to get on to tv uh-huh. and i knew that i was initially i thought youtube would be my avenue i'm going to build an audience of my own with myself so i'm never going to paint myself into this corner and i did it for years and i used to get 300 views i was <laughs> like all the time That's i dropped a vlog of, why you love this my numbers <laughs> no those are the numbers no i used to get 300 yours is the number you get 300 now. now there's actually a lot because a lot less but anyway no no so so you know what i mean it's like for years i did it for love and so when people discovered me there was a back catalog of two years worth of work yeah and then boom you know like in lockdown i think people just a captive audience and i also think a lot as to do with the fact that i portray south african colored people in the way they should be portrayed and not the stereotype i i think that how oh, do i get a clap for that? yeah no nah, this uh, the spot goes is big on on that type of uh, feel like uh, supporting the right. colored people um, how many how many how many how many people do you know that are gangsters <laughs> handful <laughs> Yeah. I know my best friend growing up is a uh, 28 now so Yeah but we, we it's it's an anomaly bro <laughs> sounds like it's a, a, most of the time your family your mother your father your sister your decent people trying to put their kids through school just like everyone yeah. else it's, if you took colored people south african colored people and you match them up to any other culture in the country the same proportion of gangsters in those cultures why is it become so much the truth with us it's like people believe that that stereotype just feels a little bit more real or maybe it's just from my perspective so i've mm-hmm. always felt like i'm like no man my my both my grandies were domestics my grandfather was a bus driver my other grandfather worked at a bakery i th- i think that negative parts are part of our culture but we are more than that also. absolutely and, and there's a lot more, more than that <laughs> yes. than the part than yeah. the part the, the negative yes. parts so like like i mean like like people like you like what you do you're a comedian and stuff like there's a lot more positive people doing positive things then 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 or colors yeah. for that the, yeah. the matter, for that matter doing po- positive things yeah yeah I, I, <laughs> i don't know sometimes sometimes we try to promote colored people on this on this mm-hmm. podcast a lot that is that's to, sort yeah. of why we built this thing and and we we, we do athletes we do this hip hop we do, we've we had hip hop people on here comedians mm. but also sometimes it feels like we crabs in a bucket man and i've got to bring that 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 yeah. that, that, that part of it like and especially in cape town mm-hmm. more so than in johannesburg like mm. like i think that's like one of our biggest like problems like even yeah. like you know mario yes I mario's know. been trying to build something for so long and I, i every time i tell him you're doing dope things and those mm. things but there's also like i feel this he can get a lot more support than what he's getting right now yeah yeah Ah, you um, know you, and that goes and around. it's almost like a, it's a crabs in the bucket thing like they don't want to some people is there is there a certain part that they want to see him grow beyond what they they did or is it not in handing the baton on to the next person to let them grow it more? i i think that we are very hurt people and i think that we've gone through a lot and it, i think that it's very difficult sometimes i feel it in myself sometimes when i go why isn't why isn't that me or why isn't that jealousy. happening to me jealousy is a very real thing humans have and i don't think that's in it i i think it it definitely is a thing and i think that they we can support each other a lot more but i think that we come from a lot of trauma man and and sometimes we don't ident- it's not just the crabs in a bucket thing is because we don't we identify the thing that that ugliness inside is is a comes from a hurt place like i didn't have that opportunity you know what i mean so like i don't know how to process my feelings around this so ah hey mu tok ma sa mut mai af sank ek hoop hai you know then it it manifests in something ugly and we pull each other down it's definitely a thing you you come from a marketing background am i right 
Yes. Were you very successful in that marketing yes. space? Yes. You see, you, you seemed like that, and you were making like decent money. I was doing very. I, I, I would. I would say, I was. I had those marketing jobs that everyone at university is starting to be one day. Yeah. I got and then that from job. that, you became a top comic as well. Yes. Yes. And like that is like I, I work in marketing now. Are you working marketing? <laughs> I'm a graphic designer, but oh, I work fantastic. I work for for marketing companies as well. Mm. I've worked in in the marketing obviously mm. the marketing mm. department, mm. but it's like there's so much there's so much opportunities for me to 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 look at other people and like yo why couldn't I be a comic? Why couldn't yeah. I be a top marketing yeah. dude? Why couldn't I do this? Why couldn't mm. I do that? And I think I, I also acknowledge it within myself, mm. but I don't think I'm gonna grow if I uh have that attitude towards you man I rather I rather i would rather want to speak to you and see okay we did how did you get it right like mm. so that mm. i can build on from there like that knowledge and like okay mm. this is where i can get it right mm. and i feel that's the way like I, we must must rather have come uh, conversations with each other mm -hmm. how did you get it right but what do you what what can mm. you what can i do better and stuff mm. like that but this i don't know i i <laughs> like you say it come from the, the third it's place a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a thing that comes from a lot of trauma and, and lack of opportunity and uh, and hopes and, and dreams that have died and then yeah your best friend next door that that feels like comes from the same background as you got a break but is it really lack of opportunity i, I think here's some, a bra from hanky that's rising to the top Mm -hmm. Why you can look on a bra from uh, Johannesburg or Cape Town or, or, or Durban or so rise to the top? No, but I, mean, I think people must look at like it in, in this aspect in the things like I can also do it. Mm -hmm. It's possible. It is within me, but not everybody has that attitude. No, people don't have that all that attitude. Uh, uh, and and I I I will say this: I've been very pleasantly surprised. But because I've experienced that whole thing where people don't are not rooting for you, they angry and all that. But as of late, I've been able to. I just met and I'm gonna name drop now. People like recently, I've, I've been able to be around people like Aiden Thomas. Yeah, and I've been around Emo Adams, and I've been around people like Salome, and and I've had in the in the in the upper echelons of South African entertainment, uh. there is. A tremendous amount of support amongst brown people. Yeah. Like, um, I just did a, a, a gig for Saru, which was like a mind blowing thing for a brown from Anki to do a thing for <laughs> South African rugby. And yeah. the recommendation came through Aiden Thomas. So, like, there is a lot of people that are not like that. Yeah. But they, for we, you, it seems yeah. as, uh, we see people clapping for you. Yeah, and it's they're like cheering. Little. But I mean, it's also because I've made it a conscious effort to try and pass and help as much as I can. But there's a man, man says, but this is, <laughs> who can explain all these things all the time? I just feel like a lot of that stuff comes from they couldn't achieve the thing and whatever reason they now, there's a feeling that they don't know how to, they, it's difficult for them to be happy for you yeah. because they wanted that red car so badly. <laughs> and no, for Stanji, like it's, 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 it's nuanced I, and I, I, always, I always like to bring the conversation back to the positive, even mm. though we've said that, yeah. I would like to say in, in, in your corner, I've seen a lot of people cheering for you from Cape Town, yeah. from everywhere in South Africa. Yeah. And it's like, there's probably for everyone, I, uh, uh, a hundred people cheering. There's like one hater that's an I, asshole and stuff like I, that. I'm and lucky. that is dope to see, to see how people get behind you. Even like, you're not from Cape Town and mm. to see Cape Town uh, uh, sell out your shows. I'm like, nice. every time I see that post, I like Mal. it. Like, it's quiet. It's it quiet. This man's doing little things. You're going to make me cry. It's exciting. Because, <laughs> because I would say I'm very fortunate. I go, I would go as far as to say it's one in a thousand negative comments on my thing. Like, it's ridiculous, yeah. right? And I think that again, there it comes down to I've bled in front of them. So I like, I don't fake it when it goes bad either because, you know, People can sense that there's what's real and what isn't. Yes. I, a couple of three years ago, this year I'm sold out to Baxter. Three years ago, I had to cancel a show, lost all of my savings. I told him that. I cried in the camera. The next day I pulled myself together. And I think that people, it's important to show as much reality as possible. Yeah. 
people are not going to root for you if you just superman all the time no you know what i mean it's the most boring superhero <laughs> you <laughs> we love wolverine because he's broken and he's alcoholic and sometimes he does a good thing and you know yeah the hero um, arc <laughs> yeah <laughs> you mentioned like uh, people like to see the vulnerable side in the, the truth. every the everything in yeah. the side of you i want to ask you about something like uh, sometimes natalie's like upset mm. and then you like record like that mm. like Maybe what are you doing? <laughs> I always think of you. That's bra. When you get away with camera, it's gonna get blocked. So yeah. like, <laughs> how but, do you get away with that? Like, my wife, uh, she tolerates a lot. She listen, man. I I shoot the video and I take the risk. And then <laughs> sometimes I go. She's not gonna. I go. Say, I'm gonna divorce you. It's all right. You know what I mean? It's just. I catch her in those moments because I know, you know, it's authentic. It's real. Uh, we don't do take two. Let me do it again. But it's, she's not. She's not laughing no, afterwards. She's, she's afterwards, it's like I'm imagining it's a good two, three hours of silent treatment or days. something like that. I was days. Days. <laughs> <laughs> <But, okay. laughs> I'm like so, so. So, but no, she, she's she's starting to. She's gotten used to it because I like the women like it because. It's what's happening in the household. It's true. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's Maybe like, that's why I'm because yeah. I know, like yeah, I'm like that's nervous, that's laughing that's myself. That's like, I, I can just go out. Yeah. He's got the plug. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Listen, we keep it real as real as possible. There are moments, very rarely, that she says you can't post that thing. <laughs> I was too un- I was too rude to you, or like ever. She doesn't, you know. But it's very rare. We keep it. You keep it hundred percent. Well, I real. guess that's what what people have, have started to gravitate to, and like like I said before, isn't maybe that like maybe that's part of the reason why you've 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 had a, a big increase in following over mm. the socials. People have seen like the the humanity mm. to you, like and and it's very difficult. I, th- I think we spoke about this uh, before the podcast. It's like. I mentioned to you, it's like difficult for me to do stand-up comedy because how do I explain in five minutes who I am? Like, I'm just yeah. coming across as like a, a douche each time I try and explain it. Like, it's, it's tough to- It's very difficult to, 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 to capture people's attention, explain yeah. to them who you yeah. are in five minutes. It's hard. And then start to get lost from it. It's, it's why so few professional comics make a living from it. It's the most difficult. It it can be like it's very hard. It I it has to be something you really enjoy doing. I f- I find. I think. Excuse me. The guys that 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 do well are guys that would would do their job for free anyway. So it's it's very difficult. It's a craft. It's something you have to work on. And there's an inherent amount of ability you have, or you you know you can work only so hard. But there's an amount of ability that. Mark Lothring, whenever I, w- I use Mark Lothring because he's a sort of what I grew up on, right? Yeah. When you meet him and you sit around a dinner table, everyone gravitates to him. And when he's himself, he's the same person on stage. And so like that is in him. Like, and then he also has a ridiculous work ethic. So he's going to be successful at it. Uh, yeah. uh, comedy, stand-up is very, very, very hard. And you see it when you see social media guys. Now, I don't see myself actually as a social media guy. Although that is my arc, right? Mm-hmm. I was doing stand up for for ten years before the social media thing picked up. But you see, social media people they might have three hundred thousand more followers than me that can't because walking on a stage is a different skill set completely. Keeping a live audience's attention, staying in the moment, and moving through your material is a skill set that is very difficult. To learn, you can't learn that overnight. That's a time thing, and so a lot of people that you can have a huge following, they'll have one one-man show, it'll be a dismal failure, and then they'll never come back to the stage again. That's why so many of your social media. Do you think you there's so many guys that are watching me that are big in social media? They're going, I think I can do that. The oh, reason, definitely, yeah. the thing, the reason why they're not doing that is because somewhere they went on a stage, and no one laughed. You but know. the first time when you get up, maybe you know one will laugh. But the more you get up, you, some you, you people get up there for fifteen years and no one laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> I won't mention names, but <laughs> now you, you see, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that guy. I don't know if I'm uh, like a lot of time. I question like, am I funny enough to do this? Like, mm, I don't want to be that guy. That, you have to be honest that, with yourself, and the audience tells you. Don't ask your friends. Yeah. When you're up there, you come off, and you watch the next act. You watch the next act. Hello, lachen out. Do it, fibra. 
Hulle het vir jou gegiegel, want the sympathy. Believe them. Don't make me tell you you're bad. It's not fair on me. I like you. <laughs> don't, don't do that. You see it. I see it with people that are professional comics. I promise you. And 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 the com- community, the comedy community, know me for many many years longer than what the public knows me. And they know me for being ridiculously tough on comedians. And I'm tough on myself. I'm. I am very critical of comedians because I really love it and I really work really hard at it. There are maybe in this country 10 people that are making a, maybe okay let's stretch it out to 20 people that are making a real living out of comedy. Like just stand up. I would say 10 not not 20 because mm. a, a lot that even you go into 20 a lot of them is doing ads and yeah. TV yeah, and all right, that yes. type of things like. No that's uh, what there's something 10, extra or there's radio 10, or yes, something like that. Yes, you're 100% right. So the, the the first 10 would be ones that are just uh, making money public of comedy. Facing, yeah. And then the second 10 tier is corporate owns. There's yeah. a lot of corporate owns. Lots of them making money of MC work. But there's very few guys that like hold an audience and they come year after year like Mark, like Riyad, like Nick, like Skumba, like you know, I can mention them like just off the top of my head. Um it, it, there's a very few tons of them in, like a lot of them in Cape Town. That's yeah. what I also learned from Cape Town uh, and the comedy in Cape Town. Years ago is to come up here and Kurt Skunrat told me at the bar is club. Now I'm doing the show on Saturday. Sold out. I said, no, no advertising. <laughs> What do you mean? I go, no, I'm going to show. I'm going to do a show. I smoked to do an hour. I say, but you haven't really been doing like stand up outside of your club. For, he said, yeah, but I mean, I go. Then I realized, oh, okay. At that point, I was making all of my income out of corporates in Joburg. And it was a decent living. But I go, it's going to end because corporates move on to the next person that's hot and young. Mm-hmm. This guy has an audience that he built over 20 years that won't leave him that easily. Mm-hmm. And and in Cape Town, because of the theater culture, Cape Town has this beautiful thing where they support their acts. Yeah. In in and and I'm not taking away from any other city there are I've got a great following in Johannesburg. I'm just saying that comedy when I was doing comedy then my reality was that my money would come out of corporates. But in Cape Town there was a lot more audience focused stuff these guys were building audiences yeah you you mentioned quite a bit of names there yeah Moasa mm. and, yeah. and Nick and Kurt and yeah. Bok uh do you know that you the what they would say is like in, in fighting they say the pound for pound so do you know you're the pound for pound number one comedian right now i don't know i think i i, I just look at just look at sell out show, show yeah. selling out yes yes No, if I don't. At, if you look at that type of thing, pound for pound. I'm yeah. not saying you're the most funniest yeah. guy ever to yeah. ever do no, the I thing. I, I I do think you're funny. Show, come but, on. <laughs> but I'm saying so that, <laughs> right now, pound yeah. for pound, you're the best. Like you, I, you, I, I, you, I thank you. Do you know that, right? Thank you for that compliment. And I how really does it sink it. in? Like I I I'm still coming to terms with that, and I'm I'm going to be hesitant to just take that title because, and I'll tell you why. Because people have this tendency to want to compare you. To people, right? Like, and it's natural. My parents do it. Everyone does it. You know, it's it's a normal thing, right? But I just want to put it in perspective for people. I go, I have a wonderful support system right now. Great audience, and I'm definitely one of the top selling commercial yeah. entities. But Mark Lottering <laughs> is selling 30 nights at the at the at the, at the Baxter Theater in the main theater every night is sold out i sold seven nights seven nights is a ridiculous <laughs> amount of people but 30 <laughs> okay that that Joe that Barber, is a lot Joe but, Barber sold 30,000 tickets but those are legacy I'm acts i'm at 10% are, of that <laughs> <laughs> that is legacy <laughs> acts man yeah, I, i get it i know what you're saying <laughs> i would put them in a different bracket i, yeah. I just want to know if you to look at the, the most active how they're doing the most uh the content that's 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 fresh all the yeah. time every show like Mark Lutrin's doing anti mole for for six yes. years so yeah. come yeah. on yeah. if you were doing your yeah. Uh, yeah. specific thing for for that while you build yeah. up a massive fan base no and thank you so much I really appreciate it and you don't understand how many nights I'm alone crying about that I'll be <laughs> honest with you I'm a bit of a sachta oh you know so like I go like yesterday I called my father at like one o'clock I said dad can you believe that we sold those two nights because It's an enormous undertaking. The Baxter Theatre is this cultural icon. It's where people in apartheid 
could go to and dress up it was allowed for people of color to go so there's this it's like a bastion in the in the theater communities and stuff and to just to be just involved in in the theater just give the dog a chance <laughs> <laughs> I just saw the producer <laughs> running around the board. Scoop the dog outside. Wow. Very junky. So, so I mean, it is. It is. Listen, it is overwhelming, and I and I and I try. It, it's an overwhelming amount of people, and the amount of gratitude that I have, you can see it in my eyes. You know what I mean? It's it's ridiculous. I go to Port Elizabeth. I used to struggle to sell eighty tickets. I sell rooms out. I go. I can't believe you know how many times I have to talk to myself and go no, I need an opening act to do this or something and then theatrics and then my wife would go and my brother is big on us he goes they didn't come to see that act and they go oh yes they did come for me I, I you know what I mean I forget I'm the main thing because yeah. I go like I cannot be enough it's also that thing in your head is it you know what uh, I mean it can't be just me the man said but tell him what I'm going to create with more for the best and then all I need to do is walk out there and I go yes they are such a time yeah. so it's 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 very humbling it's it's great bra it is so, wonderful if I didn't have this audience they came at the perfect time because I I would have had to I don't know I would have had to sell my house and cars no man no 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 it's true no no I'm always you. looking out for you <laughs> no listen to me so covid it uh, i And didn't it's, you go up during covid like I went your up numbers during covid, COVID. <laughs> but i'm a, i'm a also a, i outside of the softy there's a there's a lot of fight in this dog yeah. so covid it i'm a full time comedian that time i'm making all my money out of corporates and in club gigs but corporates is where my money comes out and i'm doing vlogging but it's not making money yeah corporate uh, the, they put us on 29 months i'm a great predictor and i think maybe it's from my instincts from my home and the marketing stuff i've done i'm a great predictor of a trend i went nightly buckle down draw all the money from the cards credit cards you have anything you've got because this is going to go on for two years and this thing is going to cripple us start selling stuff now she goes why are you being so hard go why no it's going to be two weeks i think two weeks i said now it's the beginning The next day they canceled 17 of my gigs. So technically I was unemployed and my wife was unemployed. So now we're sitting there going, how? So, and this time I don't have a big audience. There's nothing to fall back on. I can't do a, oh, I'm doing an online show. I'll probably make five grand. Mm. You know, it was like, it was nowhere. Yeah. So I was, I was earning my money from corporate South Africa. Then something in me just went to work. So the way I survived, um, the way I survived lockdown wasn't, because of the audience the audience is those videos don't pay yeah there's no vlogging never when people go oh no he's probably making tons of ads when i'm mon- i make uh, every month i make around 2 to 3 million views i get 8000 rand for that just like that from thing. youtube from across all my platforms oh, okay. youtube is the least <laughs> youtube is a grand yes no man with a child and a wife can 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 live in a house like i have with 8 grand a month Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot of money when I was 22, but it's not now. So I go, and it and it's now it's eight grand. Yeah. That time it was nothing. So like audiences, the the idea of the way you monetize an audience is of, of ticket sales and of endorsements, not because they watching the video and there's a little ad that popped up. People in their heads think when that ad pops up, I'm getting a 55 rand. No, mm-hmm. it's point zero 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 one cent. You so, know what I mean? It's, it's it's very tiny. The CPA is a tiny. So what was the thing that got you out of the? Made me survive. Yeah. What's so, the thing so that, that brought you out? So the... I'm a marketing guy, right? <clears throat> um. So to give people perspective, I finished university. I got an internship at L'Oreal. I became a brand manager there. I used to I used to market all the L'Oreal cosmetics. I was that guy. Then I I went from there and I went to. GSK and there I was the head of brand manage I was the brand manager for Aquafresh South Africa and from there I went to Federal Mogul and I did uh, brake pads for Middle East and Africa so I had a very comprehensive marketing degree nice so that This was all in Johannesburg eh? all in Joburg right that was that was the first 10 years of me in Joburg right it sure. overlapped that's with a nice point. bit of uh work for no, the first I, 10 no, years no I had a great job I, I telling try and tell your parents that you're leaving that job to do stand up 
<laughs> I had a house. <laughs> I paid a house <laughs> and I had a car and a medical aid and I could travel. At what age was that? From the age of 20, I'm, uh, you know, for about 20, 27, 23, 24 to about 29, 20, well, till about 32. I was doing comedy and, and, and that job overlapping at the last couple of okay. years because I, I, I don't believe in, this is what I want to tell your audience too. That thing where on Instagram, they like to go, oh, I left my job and I jumped. No, that, that is not realistic. <laughs> they don't Try and do yet. both as long as you can. That's mm. what I did. But anyway, back to this thing. In lockdown, I had done a couple of campaigns for, for a bank at that time. I'm not gonna mention the bank's name. We don't have a contract at all, but so I call the banks up, I go, listen, I've got this marketing, I put the plan together for, because I know how those things are supposed to look. I know what they're looking for and I know what challenges they're sitting with. And yes. I know they're sitting with budget that needs to be spent. It's probably reduced, but people are at home. People are asking, how does a payment holiday work? How does, um, if I don't pay my credit card, what will happen? There was a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So my first script I wrote, and I went to pitch it at banks, I calls, I go, listen, I've got the gear, I've got a production company. I'm gonna shoot my videos and I've got the script look here and I'll be the talent in it so that there's no COVID problems. I make it as easy as possible for you. And I made the budget just enough so that my, I could pay my house and feed my kid and my wife, right? It was like an easy yes kind of budget I put together. Sent it out a week later, just putting my feelers out. A week later, they called me back because I'd already worked with a bank. They said, this is a great idea, but now who's gonna shoot it? I said, I'm gonna shoot it. I've got the gear here, let me shoot it for you. I'll send it to you rough. You guys can approve whatever you like yeah. and I will shoot it until it's re ready. They go, really? Cool, go shoot it. I'm telling them I've got gear. I've got one camera and a phone <laughs> and a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> right? Ek, oh no, don't worry. I'm, I'm not no saying- No sound equipment. No, no, because I know what makes people on the other, because I used to be the guy on the other side. I know if I say, no man, I'm gonna do it here by my house somewhere with my phone. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I go, no, I'll, I'll speak to my script writer. I'm the script. Oh no, don't worry, my camera guy. Um, he'll, he, no, but can he get, no, no, we've got certificates because, you know, they work for my business. I, I got them certificates. No, the bra lives in my house, he's me. But they don't need to know that. So like, there's a little bit of that happening because I just needed the money. Yeah. So eventually they just said, yes, I do the first one. Huge success. They say, let's commission another one. I say, great, two, three, four. So now it's not a lot of money, but I'm surviving now. I don't have so to. So you were just like shooting into the camera and you just Shooting chats, into the camera, you'll see those. Chat uh, into the camera and you edit it. Edit it, then I do the script, I go, you guys wondering, hey, it's Alfred Adrian. You guys are wondering how these payment holidays are working. This is that. 30 seconds, bang, put the edit together, send it to them. No, we don't like that. Reshoot. Pa, 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 pa. Wait, oh no, foggy tonight. I have to do it outside. Different settings. In my complex, I'm there. People are like, what? I'm shooting. Then I go, package the stuff, send it to them. They then go, okay, cool now. That's great. Because at this time, I'd now already done for three, four years, been editing video and stuff. Yeah. So like, it, a beautiful coming because I'm trying to vlog. So yeah. I knew how these gear works. I know yeah, I knew how to, to make the mic not clip and edit and all that. And I know what software and suites to use. And I know the job. I know the guy's sensibilities. I know they need to send money somewhere to keep them relevant too. So we do three, four. By the fourth one, now I'm getting really cocky. Fourth one, I go, listen, you know what? I think I must bring my wife into this. She's really good because she's now a line item. So I add her into as a salary. They paying. I go, <laughs> Five episodes, six. After the year, the first year, we done like eight. And those were enough to like make me survive, keep a little money back. The next year I did another couple. Then we won an international banking award with it. Yes, <laughs> In my house, bro. My if, if, if anybody would ask me, that is one of my greatest magic tricks, surviving lockdown. Because my wife had no job. She then started selling clothing and that started working. And then the social media stuff, was fantastic because it, it grew tremendously, but I wasn't making any income from it until after COVID came.
But that was like a hybrid of like marketing and comedy and everything that you've done bro. along the way mm. just to like make an, a, a product. I, mm. I like that because like as a graphic designer and like a podcast, I don't I don't see the, I'm still finding my thing that I'm going to, you know, that I'm going to make, 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 make happen for myself. Mm. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going, going through that process, taking my time to mm. go through that process. But yeah, I like that type of thing. Like I spoke to this once, um, we had this guy he's from GD Suits. Mm. And his name is Gareth Duncan. Yeah. So he, 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 all he did was he saw these suits. He saw there was a lack of people making tailor making suits in Cape Town, or that market was being yeah over reduced for somehow. Then he saw um, there was cheap how they cheap they made suits in Thailand. Yes. So he stole that idea, mm. opened like the suit company in Cape Town, and I is like one of the best, like all the top people is like <laughs> you just see the all the influences going to him oh, or everybody's marriage is going crazy to it's like i don't know man it's like you must give me this brass number i need suits my bro <laughs> G- gd suits i'll, I'll GD send you yeah, yeah. Get the dope suits the yeah. dope suits yeah. yasin used him before oh, yasin bounces him. him yeah he's make the, the you know, such good but this is the type of person he is man i was like I, I like that type of vibe mm. in that people. Mm. When you tell me a story of how you married comedy and marketing, it's like, ah, this is the stuff that I yeah. like to hear about. This is what this podcast is It's a about. trifle, dude. It's this thing where it's a lot of things that come together over time that you, you have to just like tap into to all your resources that you, that you built and developed over time. Like when I walk into the studio today, I was mentioning how amazing this stuff is. Because I know I've tried to buy these things. It's expensive. But I'm like, you take all of your things and you put it together and it's something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And and you sort of, I, I just like, my father taught me to be resourceful. So I always go, um, my father has a corner shop. Bruh, there. We used to sell bread <laughs> and Vardla Muna. This time of the year, we're selling watermelons in Jeffrey's Bay. I'm sitting <laughs> in a van just selling watermelons. And it was about... Entrepreneurial sense, eh? Completely. It was about, it's about making feeding the family and make doing anything to get there and no job was n- not good enough i've sold rubber sandals i've poured paraffin i've i've spoken in front of the president of namibia it's a wild world i live in mm. it's a crazy one but the one thing i've learned is just to to um believe in yourself just a little bit more every day and just push because none of these extraordinary things come from doing the same stuff every day mm. You know, you're not gonna, I'm not all of a sudden going to become a bodybuilder if I don't aggressively start training. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you have talking, to start Talking about that, like that. Your, let's talk about your recent, your, 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 your show, Unfit, Unfit. Unfit at 40. Mm. How old are you now? When did you turn 40? I turned 40 in August. Is it? Yeah. So I'm older than you. <laughs> you're older than me. I wouldn't say though. I look I like I'm your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you're the foot, I, you're I, the foot part. <laughs> so I turned um, uh, 14 in July, like, and it's like, it's, but it's also, let's not talk about the unfit mm. part. Let's just talk about the 40 part. Mm. Like, I think it's like that. Oh, yo, I'm getting to that age now. Mm. Oh, and it's also for me, like, like I, I try to talk about it in comedy. Like when I used to go out before, I roll my ankle. Like that same mm. night I'm partying. Mm. Now yeah. I stump my toe and I can't walk yeah, for a day. So exactly. it's, you feel your your, your yeah. body almost like getting yeah. older. No, no, I'm breaking down. The next day it felt like there was, yo, my knees, I can feel it. So I go, this show is really about um, not just getting older, but also how I'm managing walking through this new cancel culture Mm. because I mean well, but I don't always know the right terminology. (laughs) And sometimes I step my step. It's that age thing. It's also how um, my my marriage or my relationships were when I was young and how it is when I'm now 40. You know, my wife is different and my relationships are different. My, my, you know, those, so it's those two positions. That's yeah. the show. That's what the show is really about. It's not just about, yeah, my body's breaking down. I do a lot of that stuff, but it's also about my perspective and how it's changed and how I'm trying, but I can feel my, my bones are getting old. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's things like I say the wrong thing sometimes and people have to correct me. And I was always the guy correcting my dad. It's, <laughs> it's things like that. So that's what the show is around. So you, you mentioned like your dad, like, but I imagine my dad at 14, huh? Yeah. Like he was like, he had like a mustache and stuff like it. This was like, he was like a, like a older 40 than what I'm 40. Yeah. Don't you feel, feel like, like that? Yeah. I mean, you in a basketball shorts. Imagine you. <laughs> I don't imagine you there my walking buddy. around with a basketball shorts and he was 40. I remember like. my father when he was 40. 
Mak pale ya dispense nice and high, mak frim. This that's nice that. and high. Like Raja a decent. Raja dia ada mustache like a Magnum PI. Mak like. pale used to have the mustache, the, the snort. beard, <laughs> with a duck chain, wide open ear, with a tusk. You have to have a tusk, otherwise you're not the alpha male. Hey, tanned it for that. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it feels different, eh? Very yeah. different. And so I just like, but that's what the shows are about. That's what yeah. the shows about. And there's a lot of. Yeah, it's a lot of. That's why my audience is fundamentally around is married people, thirty-five and older. How old is Ethan? Four. Four years. I'm ten years, ten times older than my son. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's four years old. But don't you feel that your relationship with him is different as to your relationship with your dad? I've got I've got three kids. Mm-hmm. Like um, congratulations, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'd love to. I have don't more kids. Like. <laughs> No, you don't clearly. <laughs> No, I'd love to. I'd love to have a bigger family. I think family is everything, and I think that we justify it with like, oh no, but money, and the money, and the money, and the money. You'll find the money. But my f- parents made less money, and they had more kids. Yeah, <laughs> I feel know? that the relationship is different though. Like the way they, like you say, the alpha male. Yeah, the, the tank. To be the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, my dad, wasn't like tell you like I love you. I yeah. love you, son. Like whatever. Yeah. Somebody now is hugs and kisses and hey, come yeah, here, my boy. Totally. It's and that's different. good. I mean, that's we are, we are evolving as a people. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that whole thing we spoke about crabs in the bucket. There's also a lot of things that we've evolved out of. You know what I mean? Like we are now way more conscious about mental health. Yeah, we are growing as a people. It's it's like my father never used to. I love you. <laughs> yeah, except for me, like that, I love you all the time, and it's and it's and it's great because. Yeah. We have to evolve, and he will do things differently. And 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 and. But yeah. is that the generational curse that they they refer Ach, to? I think like, also, man, you must remember. You imagine your father in 1985, bro. It's a different world. Yeah, homophobia is rife. Um, there is no LGBTQ community things. There is no a woman must know a place still. You know, it, it, it's but it's even a different that, time. The, how a, a colored man gets treated in his community at job and stuff like that. He has to like be a, hard. Yeah, yeah, has to be hard. He can't be humane. My father was um, embarrassed. I could see it. I I did embarrassed because at a eulogy for my aunt, his sister, I cried on stage. I could see there was a moment where he's embarrassed by it because he comes from a time where if you cry, you're soft. And then he, it took him a minute to figure out that the audience really connected to. The fact that this bride really miss, is going to miss his aunt. It's being vulnerable. Being you, yeah, being vulnerable wasn't an option for my father. You know mm. what I mean? It was less of an option. So mm. now, you know, they come from. A, they, that's why I'm sure. I don't know what the stats are, but I'm sure suicides were rife amongst proud men that we don't even know of. Like, like just because the fact you can't live like a piece of steel all the time. Yeah, just the fact that you can like talk about being unfit at forty yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, and then another man can laugh at it like, ah, ha, I'm also, also, I can relate and to I'm that. And I'm not feeling any way about it. Yeah, like imagine my dad. I my doubt dad. the man <laughs> back in the day would be that vulnerable on stage explaining uh, how he feels about himself. Never think about the comedians of 1980s. Do you ever see Tola van der Merwe? That's all. He'll Barry Hilton speak about their feelings about mental health. But no, never. And also, I have to give my dad a lot of credit. My dad really tried to stay with the times. If I look at my father, and I think it's got a lot to do with how we came, uh, how we um, developed. My dad comes from that time, but he really tried hard to 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 be progressive. Like, because if I look at my friends' fathers, yo, but I, everyone had to be macho and uh. the main o and ni man fatel for maini and. And that is a very hard position because if everyone's like that, yes, you know, this has to happen. Yeah, and that sparks and ugliness happens there. Yeah. Where if we can just try and understand you each other, you see that on the Cape Flats a lot. Like yeah. everybody wants to be the main man. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. mean? Yeah. So that's when the, the the guns and the shooting and the fighting all comes in. Like yeah. the one guy like tries to out like do yeah. the next guy. Yeah. So no. he becomes more aggressive yes. and or more. Yeah, it's like how we treat dogs, bro. If you think about it, nah, like, and I'm gonna stop here. But I go, <laughs> if you treat a dog, that's how dogs are. We used to go to like you walk through a, when you're on the on the promenade in Cape Town. Yeah, when a white auntie comes past <laughs> with a, anybody with a dog, whatever color they are, they want to make it a color thing. Anybody on the promenade, because you bang fire one only. <laughs> but I'm dead scared of the dogs in Anki. <laughs> and dead scared of you know what I mean. I'm not just yeah. walking through because you train those. 
dogs into being vicious, vulnerable, and scared. And that's how humans are in many ways. I don't yeah. want to make that comparison. That's a comparison I'm trying to make is that yeah, these guys you, are put right. in circumstances where- In the area. They, yeah, that they, they, they feel that they have to defend otherwise, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas there's no chill, bro. Cool down there, man. It's all right, you know? You're not gonna, we're not gonna fight over silly things. So, I mean, they come from a different time. But that's coming, that also comes with staying in those areas, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's for them to go out of those areas, mm. to see a bigger world out there, the Cape Towns. Like, mm. it's like, so I've also been, I, I lived two years in London, like, and mm. I also had that awakening. When I went to London, it's like, when you're there, it's like, oh, this world is bigger than what you think it is. Yeah. You open yourself up to new ideas, yeah. Yeah. like 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 a different pers- people's perspectives on things. Mm. And I think I think maybe some people stuck in that that type of areas. They I I think that sometimes we must also in our own areas, even in those areas, we must listen to our elders again. Because the Shh, older that has stopped. Hey. No, because <laughs> you must listen to your elders. Because the older men will tell you, we went through this, bruh. People just get killed here. Yeah, come sit here, my boy. This, this, you and this light, you grew up together. Now, why are you killing each other now? You know, like, just let's listen and be, because the older men in those environments have been through it all and understand it better than we do. And they often now, they're old. My dad is great now. My dad is great. My dad, my dad um, once told me that, he said, boy, you know what? We come from a time where if you play tennis, you were gay. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> No, man. No. I didn't mean to know. But <laughs> no, it's funny. Go, what, what do you mean, Daddy? No, it's the white clothing. Then I was like, yo, brah. Just think about that sentence. It's hilarious, but that's shame, man. He wanted to play tennis. <laughs> Can even shame, nah, he God, we must listen to our elders. They got the answers. In those areas, there's people that got the answers. How, how, how was your international shows? You went to, I think you went to Australia. Mm-hmm. You spent some of the time in Australia. And did you go to London as well? Last year I did Australia and I did London, so I did Sydney and Perth, but I've been doing that. This is also like things that people are discovering about me, which is nice. I like that about the vlogs. Yeah. Is that I've been, I've been even before my uh, social media ascent, um, yeah. I was going to Australia a lot. So okay. I'd spent a lot of money trying to develop my career in other markets because I always felt like, you know, I, I, can't, I, can, I, can't, I can't export this. It's, mm. I, it's possible. I just need, I need to give myself a chance. So I've been, go, this will be my fourth time this year uh, in 2023, I'm going back again. It'll be my fourth time going back. Did, can I, I don't know if I can ask you this, did the investment pay off like the last time or was it more of the like first, trying to grow the market? No, the first. Trying to grow your market. Yes, yes, the first two times I lost a lot of money. Is it? Tons, tons of money. I went there on my own steam. So, I, I, and I'll say this out because I think sometimes we also have to tell people how much things cost. So I'd save up every year from- So how many times have you been here? This is gonna be your fourth been, time? This is my fourth time. Okay, so, first, so the, you've, that is quite. Mm, the first time, uh, my agency then used to have a relationship with the Perth and Sydney comedy festivals. Now those okay. are the very big comedy festivals in Australia. The biggest one being Melbourne comedy festival. Then they got Brizzy, which is Bris- Brisbane comedy festival. But the Sydney and Perth ones they had a relationship with. But at that time, they did not see the value in me. So they, they would send their big hitter acts over. That, would, that, that year, the first year, Robbie Collins was on there, Johnny, John Flissmas was on. Now John Flissmas owned Wacked, he was an owner. Um, I think it was Tumi Marake, it was, uh, yeah. And then they sent, I begged them, three years, tried to get into the festival, no one would even answer me, right? Then I the, I got into this agency where they had a relationship with these guys, but they were putting on South African showcases. So like just for like because there's so many expats, right? Yeah. And so these guys would be the biggest comics they'd send over. Then I said, guys, please put me in. Then nobody ever took that too seriously until a guy called Kyron Whitemore Whitmore um, was working at the agency. Um, I said to him, listen, man, put me in the mix. I will pay for myself. Yeah. Then he said, you sure? Because listen, flights are about 17 grand, accommodation's gonna be another 20. You're looking at about 50, 60K and, and they're not gonna pay you. So I go, do it. I remember swiping my credit card for the first one. Coming back going, I need to pay 50K back. Went there. They put me on, this is how pedantic. And they never paid you, not a cent? Not a cent. I paid. 
I paid. So to, to put it in perspective, no one is coming to rescue you. No one is going to come and make your career. No yeah. one owes you anything. Yeah. That, that's a lot for people to sometimes understand. A lot of comics and entertainers go, yeah, why am I not getting, getting yeah. these opportunities? Alfred created that opportunity. Yeah. They don't know this part of it. So yeah. they think that But it's agency, good that you're telling them. People need, it's, it's because people don't see people behind don't it. And they think it's, it's that same people say, oh, I can do that. No, I came back with curve. How many I, people is willing to, to do, to, I was to, to, light to on bet on themselves, I took basically? Out, I went to, I went to, I remember opening a new credit card and zapping it. Like going, I'm taking this 50K and I'm paying back 60. Probably <laughs> zapping it, go to Australia, get there. I'm married, mind you. I'm just married. Um, <laughs> I says, after three years of trying, eventually they give me a spot. The producers of the shows take it extremely seriously. They make a ton of money. They sell 750,000 tickets. That's not a small thing, you know, in the in uh, overall for all the shows, all the different acts. So it's a big comedy festival. It's a professional outfit. And so when I got there, So many South African comics like angry because I'm getting this opportunity because I'm with Wacked. But the reality was is that mm. Wacked was doing nothing. I was paying for it. Mm. They thought that I was getting in. Yeah, now the other day, a friend of mine that's a very good Cape Townian comic said, we always thought Comedy Central sent you Owens. It's like, no, bro. Comedy Central hasn't paid for anything in my life. So I went the first year, paid the 50,000 rand. Now, listen, I didn't have the money. Like I said, I made a loan yeah. to go. Go, get there. They gave me like three slots. To do three shows, three. So three shows and then two South African showcases. So it would be like five. So I'd be on the lineup, but like the small act, the free act. The night I land there, they take us to the hotel. I stay at the hotel. Um, the next day they go, they put me on the first show. Now, little do I know at the time that those producers all there. I meet these people, they're very nice. They go, hi, Alfred, how are you doing? Cool, cool, cool. Guys, you're, we're picking you guys up. Alfred's got a show. Do you guys want to come with? Everyone goes, yeah, let's go to the first show. But I'm the first one on. I don't think about this. They put me on this showcase with Australia, a, a mix of acts from different countries. And there's a very Australian audience. So I go, what, five? They give me five minutes. These are the producers of the shows, right? They, they give me five. I go on. I am so calm and cool about the five. And thank God I was, because I didn't realize what was actually at play. I go on, it goes really well. Like these Australians are eating out of my hand at this show. I come off the show, I go, great, Alfred. That was fantastic. So, so okay, cool. You're approved. Here's your other list of gigs. All of a sudden I've got 12 gigs now, like new ones. So you were They were tested. checking. If I didn't make it there, packing pal, that was, That was the deal. So like I was going to do one season and done. So they were watching because they don't just let people on. Yeah. Because people are paying $50 a ticket. That's yeah. 500 rand. It's a lot of money. So then I did the first run. It went well. I got to know everybody. The second time I go, they say, listen, can Alfred come? They go, yes, absolutely. We love him. Will you guys pay him? No. He's not. We want only the biggest acts. We welcome him back because he was funny last year. And then after a lot of negotiation, they, they pay my flight. So now I'm paying, instead of the 60, I'm paying 40 to go. But I'm still in the red. Okay. So I'm now 90 down. <laughs> <laughs> That one, I go and I'm even, I'm, I'm, be, I'm coming into myself a little more. Because was I'm, there anybody that remembered you from the first Yes, night? yes, people remembered okay, me. Okay, so it wasn't producers. all in no, no, vain. No. And now I've got, to, I got the flight out of it now. Okay. So I was about to go for the third time lockdown happens. Everything falls apart. That agency doesn't send anybody overseas anymore. Wacked is, they, they still exist? They, they're still around, in, but at a much smaller. John, John Flissmas left WAC. Yeah, John Flissmas left WAC. They're in a much smaller capacity. Anyway, long story short, I'm on my own now. Now there's no team of South African showcase people going. But now over lockdown, I'd worked really, really hard. And I, and I already invested 100,000 rand from before. So I'm not going to let this just now float. So my following has now grown bigger. So I start calling them in lockdown. I say, listen, as soon as these gates open, I want to be in the show. They go, oh, Alfred, Adrian, no, fine. fine, bro, come. Then I say, but guys, I'm not paying <laughs> to come. Not this time. 
There you go, now listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen, with the festival, you know, they start talking you down. The festival isn't that big and all that. I say, okay, cool, let's do this. This is post-lockdown. Now it's post-lockdown. Now it's first year. Now I've got an audience now. Not yeah. just... But not just like, the audience. They like but, now the show is smaller. <laughs> but year. now, yeah, yeah. Now but, the, the, the now, but there's guys that are very kind to me over there. So then, um, they're really good to me, those people, actually. They, they go out of their way. I was, they then said, okay, cool, come through. Then I said, okay. They wanted to know how much must they pay me. Because then I go, I don't want this to be the conversation. I don't want them to look at Alfred Adrian as a South African charity case. I don't want them to go, yeah, this guy is hilarious, but we are having to fly him in and then we'll put him up. And it's almost like a, it feels too, like they are helping me too much. Like it's you don't like, want that. I don't want that. I'll tell you why I don't want that. You don't want them to pay you. I, no, no, I don't want them to pay me. Listen to me, just pause. So what happens is I, what the deal would be is they pay me a set fee. I come and do all the shows for them. I go home. So I make maybe 20,000 Rand. Okay, right. so they're not Great. paying for your flights, they're paying for your comedy. No, they, they're playing for the flights now, and now they're paying for my accommodation, and maybe I'll get a little bit of money coming back. So it's a much better deal than I'm used to, but I don't want that. Because now I've, I've grown my audience over the last, because there's now a two, three year gap between the last time I was there. So what I did is I go, listen guys, because also to get their attention quicker, what is best, best attention here? They go, we have to pay this bright X amount of dollars to come to have him over here. And then we have to put him in all these shows to justify it. Yeah. Or because he doesn't have an audience. So he's fantastic. We know he's good, but he's like something we have so that we can say we have acts from around the world. Rather, what I wanted was, I said, what do you give? What is your standard deal? I asked them. The standard deal is you fly yourself in. <clears throat> you do a lot of shows. They pay for the accommodation with the money you make from the shows and then they pay you back, right? But the real money you make is putting your shows on in the festival, your own shows. So instead of being on lineups, you go on to being a one-man show, Alfred okay. Adrian at the Comedy Festival. So you do both also? So you yeah, do so the now, lineup now, shows I'll, and your yes. one-man shows? Because the money then, like if you're coming from London, okay. if you're a comic from London, or a comic, because there's comics from everywhere in the world, if you are coming from Argentina or Peru, they put you on a, because it's normally the biggest act in Peru. Ah, see. They put you on a standard deal. They're not doing a charity case. They're okay. not going, ah, oh, shame, we need someone from Peru. That's the best guy. Let's pay him and just have him here and we'll give him lineup shows and he goes home. Okay. Because we can't give him slots as one-man show slots because those slots are reserved for people that have pool in Australia and they make a lot of money on the door split on that. So they say, for example, when, you, when a guy from London gets there, yeah. now he's paid for his own flight. They then put the online, the, the, the lineup shows together. Yeah. They pay him out of that because those lineup shows are like 2,000 seaters because it's a lineup of people. They get paid, so they pay his accommodation out of that and they pay him whatever's left. And then they go, okay, cool. Now the deal is you then have to go, we'll give you six slots. Can you sell six slots? Do we, do we put you in a 60 seater? Do we put you 100, 500 or 1,000? Because they know that they're making 30 to 40% out of that show. And they know that that's where you're really making your money because that now proves that you, you're a pool in Australia. So now you're taking risk on it, but they're also taking risk because they can give it to someone and make, definitely make their money. Those slots are valuable. Yeah. So they don't just give those slots away, like one hour slots, they don't just give it away because it's in comedy clubs and theaters and da, 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 da. How much do you get? It depends on what your show is. But how many shows did you get? So then I go, listen, this is the deal. Don't bring me over and don't do me any favors, even though you guys are willing to do so. And I bless their hearts if they're watching. I love them, right? They've been great to me. Then I, I want the standard deal because that way I'm an act that you don't, I'm not a charity case. I'm going to sell those shows. Then they put me in, in Perth for two shows. I think it was like 400 tickets. And then they put me in 200, 200, and then in Sydney, they put me in for like in a 100 seater, but also 400 tickets. So four shows. And then I sell all of those out. So now I'm selling everything out. Now the conversation this year wasn't, oh, Alfred, let's see if you, they go, Alfred, when do you want to come? <laughs> that, that's the difference. That's what I'm paying for. Business. That, that's why I don't want to be paid. Yeah. Because as soon as you pay me, the feeling and the energy is different. If you pay me, you're doing me a favor 
But if I come there and you didn't, and you making money off me with not having to spend a cent, every slot is available. Now I walked away with more money last year than I've ever seen while I was there. I made my money back from the past. And those were one-man shows you were doing. So the one now, you made now, the money off the one-man shows. So I make my money back on the one-man shows. I flew myself in. The shows went well. This year I'm going back to bigger rooms. So last year I did 100 seaters. This year I'll be bigger because we sold out because the South Africans. So you sold out the 100 seaters. All of it. Uh, was all it just South Africans, expats? Tons of South Africans. There's a lot of South Africans there, but there was also like a, um, so this is how the shows are. The one man shows are predominantly South African with people like Australians that have been married in or somebody that oh. you must also remember that Australia is different in South Africa in the sense that they've got a bigger theater culture, not because of they're more into theater, but because they've got a lot more disposable income. So yeah, if you had sense. to go to a, if you go to a, a sneaker shop, like you go to Tiki Town, you want to buy your wife. This happened to me. I wanted to buy Natalie a gift. I saw a pair of sneakers. I asked the guy, can you have this in a size, whatever. Never reveal your wife's size. <laughs> <laughs> the guy comes back, he goes, are you a comedian? I said, yes, I'm a comedian. He goes, okay, cool. Where are you? I'm on tonight. Now this brother's brother putting shoes on me. Imagine a brother that works at, in South Africa, bless their hearts, I did that job too. Works at Tiki Town or Total Sport, whatever stacky shop. That income isn't enough for them to come and spend 400 Rand on a ticket. Yeah, a definitely, night. yeah. A brother tuned me, now I'll come tonight, I'll bring my girlfriend. The night he was there, I go, oh, you guys earn a lot more yeah. than us. Your, so now your theater community is bigger because of the disposable income. There's a lot more people in the band that can pay, you know, younger people can afford to come to shows. We're in South Africa, we find that, you know, most people that are coming to theaters, and I implore people to come to theaters, but most of them are in the 30s. Yeah, yeah in, in London, I, I did like a, a construction job or a labor job, mm -hmm. and I earned enough money to, Absolutely. to live like yeah. A, a, yeah. a king, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Obviously, I was single and all those type of things. Yeah, but you, love, you could have had a family. Like, yeah, you can. You yeah. can live yeah. a comfortably off that, of so. that type of money. Yeah. Um, There's just one more last thing I wanted to get to. Okay, Ru, <laughs> we did. Um, how you, we, we said we're going to circle back to it. So, like, after all these things happened, like, recently, you got on the Ru. Mm. See, they don't want to be on, on, TV, be on TV. But I saw that's your personality. Yes. You've you been so, Alfred on, mm. on, on a route. But tell me how, how you got to that. Though. So, so, so uh, I've done a lot of couple of TV things and I don't pursue it aggressively at all. The people at Ruhr, again, Cape Town, it's Homebrew Studios. Homebrew Studios used to have me up. There's a lot of people that know who I am. Um, people like Kaylee and them, like the producers there follow me, like come to my shows, watch me, know who I'm, what I'm about, right? So they interviewed me a couple of times on, say, uh, so I'm not, <laughs> I almost said uh, Aiden's show's name, but um, on, on that talk show they had with all the ladies, like Tracy Lang and those guys. Oh yeah, like the- Afrikaans one. Like the- They and, interviewed me there. Yeah, so no. so they the same guy. Like the, the, the South African version of, of The View. It, yes, so that, exactly that. So I, I went there like three times. And always a blast, always great to work with him. Very professional outfit, Atlantic Studios. They do St. Worcester and mm. Aaron's Flay and all those things. So then one day they called me, I was still in, and they, I was actually still in, in London at the time. And they said, listen, we want to talk to you about a talk show. Then I said, listen, let's talk when I'm back home. Now in my, if you jump back and this is very, gonna start, this is, I have to say perspective. 10 years ago, I would have jumped at that. I'm like, what, what? I can call you now. When you, you know, I'll be so eager to do it, but I've bumped my head in TV so many times. It's, I've done a game show and it, and you know, bless their hearts that were in that game show and produced it, but it wasn't the right fit for me. I had to be- Were you the host? Yes, it was, it didn't work. Then I was in a movie <laughs> and, and that was better because it was funny. But every time I had tried my hand at TV, they give you a costume to wear. It's not you, you know, yeah. and it doesn't work for me. I'm not like a, I don't want to be an actor. I never wanted to be on a soap. When you call me, if you gave me the lead in a soap, now I go, no thanks man, I'd rather go and perform there to people that want to see me, for me in Cape Town. Yeah. That's, that's my dream. I'm living my dream here in peril to, uh, tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, so I go, guys, listen, first thing, I don't like doing TV. The answer is normally no on these things. Not, I love you guys. I think you guys are a great setup. Then they said, now why? I said, nothing on TV has ever worked. In fact, they came to the show where I said TV was, <laughs> that my last show was terrible. It was a whole bit about it. 
right? <laughs> and then and then they <laughs> they laughed <laughs> and came and they had this meeting with me and they said, "Listen, after they saw the but they still yeah, decided they to me. ask you." No, but we were friends, man. Like they they called me. They had this meeting and I spoke to the owners of the uh, thing and the producers and they said, "Listen," I said. It's a it's a talk show. We want to bring Roor back, but like it's a talk show more than a cooking show. Yeah. But there's a cooking elements in it. Are you cool to cook? I said no problem with cooking. I just don't want to. They said okay. Then what do you want? I said I don't want a script. No scripting. And you and and if I'm not comfortable, I'm not comfortable. Don't argue with me. I'm not wearing a costume. I'm not coming in all of a sudden. Dressed in in a clown suit, it's not you know because there, there's always some sort of an angle that comes yeah. out. The I sponsor not, is yeah. no la mayonnaise, so you must wear. But I, yeah, <laughs> I, I said, listen, within reason, cool. I'm not a difficult person to work with, but I'm telling you off the bat that I'm not going to portray brown people as a stereotype because that's not what I'm about and that's not where I come from. I'm going to be myself on the show. They said, you got it. Give us two weeks. Came back. They said, these are the list of people we want you to interview on the show. I went cool. Let's go, and that's how Roo happened. It's because it's literally no script there. Okay. There's a team of people. Also, there's no live studio audience. It's not necessary. Yeah. There's no canned clapping in. Yeah, that is. I speak to Salome if I want to know how she sings that way at Prafa. Yeah. Uh, they give me background. They give me sheets. There's no art questions. They give me sheets. I go, for example, if it's early views, my friend. Anyway, it's like they go. So I know that line of questioning already. But when I get there in the morning, I go, I get a coffee. I sit there, I go, Ali B was born here. These are the interesting things about him. He's got a new album coming out. Uh, did you know that he's left-handed? Whatever, you know, he has a third nipple. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know. Then I go, cool, got a raw background. And then I just go in there and ask. So the show gets cut down to 25 minutes. Most of the time I'm speaking to two hours of those people like this. Okay, so it's basically yeah, this, and you just the, the, take out the good bits. Yeah, and we have so a great team. Yeah, ourselves. we got a great team. <laughs> you got a great team. So, so that's basically how it, it worked, and that's why it's working. And we're shooting season two and two uh, coming now. Well, I think that's what 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 uh, what people, the type of content people want now. They just oh. want your authentic self. Yeah. They don't want that. Hey, from a live studio. Yeah, no, no, no. So I also told them I prat mingles. I'm gonna try my best to do Afrikaans most of the. I'm do. It's an Afrikaans show, but if uh. I say uh, English word, then it can't be. Oh no, stop! Let's go again. And they, it's cool. You must remember, guys. Um, Cape Net biggest viewership is the Western Cape. My people. Is it? Yeah, Afrikaans is not. I thought it would be um, Johannesburg. No, bro, West Cap. Afrikaans, we are ready. All the way from from PE up here is just Afrikaans. The biggest, I think, like seventy percent of the viewership is the Western Cape. Sure. Mm, yeah. So it's Af- Cape Net is a, is a let me and and at the risk of being controversial because I've got a lot of um, fans from different <laughs> cultures. But Afrika- Cape Net is an Afrikaans channel. Afrikaans is a coloured language. Uh, Afrika- just, Af- uh, Afrikaans is a, the, the, the is greatest it? amount of people. Afrikaans. that's ca- ca- is, ca- is coloured people. Coloured people speak Afrikaans. It's not. I think people go Afrikaans people. Afrikaans white people speak Afrikaans. But just think about this: ten percent of them. <laughs> you know, with this, the rest of the country, <laughs> forty-four people, <laughs> forty-four of them. There's According 44. to Charlize <laughs> yeah, so it's forty-four of them now, and I mean, there's, there's very few uh, compared. I mean, and don't take, don't be upset with me, Afrikaner people, but you guys know what the numbers are. But I think there's a massive, massive mingles like yes. uh, 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 in in Cape Town, like. Yeah. Like my mother-in-law, I know, like like her, and and it's uh, like she thinks like you. She speaks like you, yeah. And she probably also thinks like it. Yeah, it, it, it's all one thing, one thing, one color. The, that's the, that's it. And it's I heard generations prof- of that. I heard yeah. a professor from I think it's Pretoria. I'm not. I'll speak under correction. Say that you know how Afrikaans developed. It's obviously Dutch dialect, but there's so much that colored people have added into it. Yeah, that it's more of a colored language than anything else. Because it's the bulk of the people that speak Afrikaans is coloured people. I, I, I listened to some of your, your your Afrikaans comedy and like there's something that you shared with me today, and I, I felt it was more expressive 
the words are there's more expressive words are you almost like uh, lean, so you might be you you mix between english and africa that, is that the, the it's beyond creola my friend I, that's the one that's the oh one. yeah this is just me basically oh this is years ago i'm gonna but you do it in afrikaans like yeah 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 this is a comedy central thing and yeah this this quite interesting yeah Oh, please put this off. Put I can't. <laughs> you, 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 you use a. You swear. I swear, yeah. You yeah, swear a lot in here. Do you I still swear, swear? I swear a lot. No, I don't. I, Anymore. This was about seven years ago. Um, I used to, man, let me tell you what swearing is. In my opinion, a lot of comedians swear. I used to swear. And sometimes I fuck off a moor come eight. You know uh-huh. what I mean? But. I don't the more confident and more time you spend doing comedy the, the less you need the lang- the, the foul language if it's yeah. funny it's funny the, um if the joke needs a swear word to pick it up it's not good enough to be in the show that's my view okay. and so I don't I I stopped swearing not because I think that you'll see when new comics do uh, in stressful environments when new comics are on they they use the f bomb a lot yes it's because they're panicking and then they go to the f bomb you'll see that it's a, like it's a, it's a rookie era It's like a click. You just watch new comics. Yeah. They swear a lot. It's because they feeling so vulnerable out there and it's not sort of going their way so they throw in an F bomb, you know. To rely on it like it's a crutch. It's a crutch. I used to do it. People do it all the time. You work your way out of that. And the more you do comedy the less you swear. If you look at Chris Rock now, if you look at Tambourine, you you'll be hard pressed to find a swear word. Mm. You know what I mean? Even Dave Chappelle that's so um controversial it's the content that's controversial there's very little swearing in those things and so as comedians develop they inevitably leave swearing behind it's it's just natural because you become more confident in your ability and you express yourself better and then the swearing sort of falls by the way sir but that's when you're like a black belt yeah you become that yeah, yeah. you become that <laughs> I, 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 and also it, it, <laughs> it doesn't hurt it, in south africa swearing and and let me tell you comedy that works in south africa uh from a practical business perspective no stay away from leaning on this race jokes <laughs> leaning on race jokes uh, uh, you're just making people just making your audience I there's five rules of adrian <laughs> oh, the four oh, yeah. let's do it let's do it one more nah, time uh, stay away from the race jokes try not to swear stop talking about sex especially graphically it, it, it turns oh, out oh, gra- uh, you do something about sex in which one <sighs> You will never hear me say anything gratuitous about sex. It makes no sense. I don't know. The wrong colored guy. No, I man, there, <laughs> there is something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share oh. a link with you. No, but uh, oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's, that's like innuendo. Some, it's innuendo. Not really, I'm not talking about sex at all. You know, it's, it's me making the comparison. It's a with, BDSM. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's really light. It's okay. not like when I say sex, I mean, like some guys go in and they are very descriptive, if you know what I mean. I'm not trying to talk about anything under your pants. I have a Viagra joke. Yeah, but I mean, listen, it's also also I can over time you develop ability that I I have, I have a joke about a disabled child. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it's been on TV and I still haven't been canceled. Yes. It's how you frame those things. Yeah, yeah, and but that's also what makes you a better comic because yeah, no, no, I mean no. like you making a disabled yeah. joke uh, if a I child that, and yeah. me doing that thing, I'm going to get canceled Absolutely. because I don't have that mm. sensibility. I haven't been doing it. I'm not a black belt. I'm a, I'm a one step one it's, by it's, it's, also, it's also not that I'm the special. It's just that I've got time underneath me. Yeah. yeah I've done it a lot. So like I, I I can go like for example in my new show there's bits that when I walk off the stage I go the night i said that word way too much mm. so like it might not even it's not a swear word it, maybe it was something religious or maybe it was the word say say i used a, a word gay i used the word gay more than five times i don't cut that down it becomes jarring after two times that's how clinical you become you go mm. oh, I've, i've leaned into religious stuff even though i'm not talking about anything bad i've there's too many religious jokes here or there's too many I'm a colored guy jokes here or this you so so I try and, and I try to make the meal balanced I need to balance the show out because mm. it's it can't lean too much about my wife because as soon as you start say for example I speak about Natalie the whole time and all those jokes after jo- joke one they laugh joke two they laugh joke three they laugh joke four they start thinking why is he making so many jokes at the expense of his wife 
That's how it's it too much. Like. Yeah, there's balance with everything. It's like this little balancing act, and 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 a show is really good after you've done it for eighty times. Then it becomes like oh, we wow. we mentioned this like a few times, and you mentioned it uh, now again. It's like it's because you've been doing it for a while. Mm. And I'd like to look into that because sometimes you, you, you be some people do things for a while, mm. but they're not really that great. And I, I, I like to think of it as like, and this goes, I'm not just talking about comedy, I'm talking mm. about anything. It's like the more your craft or your art like humbles you, mm. it's like the more you eat shit. <laughs> like mm. it, it's almost like sometimes the yeah. better you get sometimes, like the more losses you take, like mm. you get uh, Floyd Mayweather, mm. he lost in the Olympics, so he goes on to become the greatest mm. boxer of all time. Yeah. Um, at some stage, some people like failed so that they can, obviously mm. it was a big time where Kevin mm. Hart was like this. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I seek those moments. I seek them in my, and, and I'm also still, I'm very much learning and, and growing. I go, there's a saying by Ernest with Hemingway that says the first draft of anything is shit. Yeah. Right. So it, it's like that. Like I don't start the show off and it's bulletproof. You know what I mean? I go little spots i do 40 seaters i do a ton of that so that i can develop the stuff now granted it comes much quicker because i've i've got experience and i know what will work and what won't work so i can sort of write a first draft that if i came out to an audience of 50 people they're gonna have a good time before they go home but it's a far cry but i sell those shows like i did the centurion ones now i sell those shows as work in progress because if that same audience came to the last show i do when i i film it a different thing mm. the same, same concepts but it's so 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 different right um so now so this is basically what happens i go and find small rooms you know i do small rooms yeah small rooms because big rooms and a lot more people so the tipping point is lower mm-hmm. it's easier to perform and get a thousand people to laugh because if 40 of them laugh it's infectious and they make it okay for the other 60 to enjoy it Maybe someone is very sensitive about race, but now if more people are laughing and they're sitting there in the darkness, more laugh, there's a couple of science things to it. Okay. But if you bring that same joke to 40 people, you'll get a more honest. realistic and honest laugh because mm. they're very conscious about the fact that there's just 40 of us here and everyone can see everyone. <laughs> in, in a theater, you know what the biggest trick is? You change that lighting, when, when the audience, have you noticed when the comedian walks out, the lighting drops in the house mm. from 40% or 30% to like 10% or 5%. Net genoeg so that iemand die kan val when they die, die kiwe klimmen, right? So there's a reason for that. Because as soon as, if you put that lights on bright like it's in here now, people go, I'm, I'm now here, there's my p- pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you put that lights off, they break them. Because mm. they feel a That's why bit comedy rooms are always darker. The dark, darker the comedy room is almost like the They're more better. comfortable. They're more comfortable sitting laughing in darkness. They're more comfortable sitting in bigger groups. It's easier to make them laugh in huge groups. I always hear the LA comics talk about like how the comedy room is the, the comedy store is so mm. dark that you it's can't dark. even see. You can't see. Far. When when I'm on the stage at the Lyric Theatre, I mm. see the first row. Maybe. I see no one after that. It's just a black hole I'm looking into. I was I was performing at the Lyric Theatre. Great, great. Yeah, be, I, listen, I did it a lot before, but this is the first time I sold it out to my own steam, and so that was a big milestone. We do you um, have like a moments like before, like you before when you accomplish these things, or yeah. when it's happening, like where you sit and think, like, yo, am I in a, am I in a, am I in the Matrix here, <laughs> or something like that? Yeah, bro. Is this really was a pinch? <laughs> but every night when I walk out in the back of the theatre, when I walk out in. The other night I walked out in George Arts Theatre, I go. How, how much people in the audience? 200. I go, bruh, you, you in George and 200 people came out and these people want to see you perform. It is, it's an overwhelming thing because you must remember, I, I've been working at this for many years. I only became popular in the last four. It, it, it is not lost on me at all that this is in a wildly extraordinary situation to be in. That out of in the world there's less than 0.01 percent of people that can be comics and even less that can sell a thousand tickets in a room it is mind-blowing in south africa there is just so so it i mean if it doesn't move you there's something very wrong with, <laughs> with you you know what i mean so like every night when i walk out at the baxter there's a moment where i just need a minute 
just to compose because I go, I mean, Cape Town of all places and these people <laughs> have spent money, yeah. dressed up, put Peter in a car, drove, told their wife to come, we're having dinner, we're going to the Alfred show, going to <laughs> Alfred show. They get there, they park, they sit, they show, they pay attention, their phones are off. You know how valuable that is? That is the most valuable. They came there for you, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is a wonderful thing. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with it every time. Like, uh, I've said a lot of good things, uh, dope things about you, in, mm. about this podcast. That, like, I think you're the pound for pound and like, mm -mm. just just what you're doing. But I can see how you got where you got. Mm. Uh, just through like this interaction here. Yeah. Mm. I'm a bit intense. I'm more intense than people think. Nah, I'm super <laughs> intense. I'm yeah. actually playing it calm today. Yeah. <laughs> I got like somebody that yeah. I look up to in the room. I'm just oh, trying thanks, to, 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 to keep it calm. But what I'd like to say is like, I can see what makes you different from a lot of other comics out there. Mm -hmm. Or I, I, I'm not talking negative about people. Mm -hmm. I, I can see what makes you different from a lot of other people out there. Mm -hmm. Right? We, you don't know me. We started mm -hmm. a conversation on mm -hmm. social media. You see the benefit in stuff like this right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of other people that see the benefit in this. Like, mm -hmm. It's like you planting seeds everywhere you go. Yes. Uh, you plant in yes. seeds everywhere you I go. What oh, you what? This is a podcast. It can get 30 views. Ah, ah, let's go. Let's plant that seed because ah. you don't know how much that seed uh, is going to, that fruit is going to bear in the future. And that yeah. is, that's the dope thing that I'd like to uh, let us um, um, see. I appreciate that, man. I know not very many people are astute enough to pick that up. I'll tell you this. I go, I've, I built this thing from the ground up. I know exactly that how it works i know i i i like when i walked in here i'm very taken up by the studio because i appreciate the amount of work that goes into the stuff right like i can, I can see what's happening it's not just that it's that i was anonymous for many years <laughs> i'm as normal as they come i i know the feeling of walking up to someone that's popular and asking for a picture i know that nervous feeling and pit of my stomach that if this person is mean to me i'm gonna be crushed <laughs> I remember that. Like it I was still yesterday. feel it sometimes, but you never might be feeling. So I go, I go. I understand that it's a very human thing, and I go, I, I, I know those things. So like when I walk in the mall and I take the pictures with the people, I'm so happy to take the pictures. They don't know how happy I'm taking the pictures with them because I go, it's. I know that these people are what carries me here. This is not possible without these audience members. And also, I know eventually I'm going to make a mistake. It's, it's, it's a lot of things. Eventually, I'm going to make a misstep in life. It, it's a human. And if I make a misstep, if I say the wrong word or I upset somebody, there's going to be at least I hope that all the good things accumulate up enough so that I can survive that. Do you and feel I, that, that, yeah. cancel, that cancel thing I coming feel for you? It, I, I don't feel it coming for me, but I, I, I think it's... the bigger you get, obviously, yeah, there's, I mean, the, people, there's the... People the, love you on the way up, bro. They, they, yeah. they, 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 <clears> then, then you become too big. Like, I remember Trevor, look like how much hate Trevor gets now. I go, why is Trevor, every time I speak about Trevor Noah, and I mind you, I've met Trevor Noah more than once. He's been wonderful to me. Nicest guy, remembers my name from years ago. Then I go, I, I can't, but in the comment section, if you say something good about Trevor, 10 years ago, everyone thought he was amazing. Now he's so big that there's a huge amount of people dragging him. I go, eventually, I just want people to remember that I'm a human being and that, you know, I understand these things. And if I didn't see you in the mall and somebody <laughs> tweets, hey, he's on Kaskak, I look for baby anymore, <laughs> then there's 50 people that can go, nah, me, bro. Nah, you're wrong. Yeah, I know you mean, I'll yeah. never treat yeah. me that way. He didn't, nah, Jay Pratt nonsense. Jay, the slechte dag had of everything. And it's just, it's also just beyond that. It, it's, 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 I'm just very grateful, honestly. And it's, it's a cheesy thing to say, but I mean, I know it's not even, I don't care that I, I, I care about different things because I've tried to, like for example, I tried to make this podcast. I've tried to make podcasts. I know what it is. I go, I know how hard it is. And when I see people putting this amount of effort in, I go, I didn't even look at your numbers. I don't know, you could have a million followers, you could have five. I go, this bra is doing everything possible to make this a success. Those are the people I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. Yeah, it's not necessarily that, like, that's why I spoke about comics before the thing. I go, a lot of comedians call me and they say, can I open for you? <laughs> I go, I used to. I go, no. 
I go no and they go but why Alfred is no one cut no funny your audience <laughs> no it's because you have no regard for what I do you 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 take this for granted and I don't yeah. when I walk in here I look at these mics I look at this bar I look at that TV I, there's a producer professional I know how much money this costs I know how much effort tears and beyond that I know how much it takes to put yourself out there in a creative space when it's got a risk of not working it's greatly vulnerable then i go with these opening sp- open spots and there's a ton of them right now and i tell them to their face all the time i came through the hard way you had to do two years of open spots before joe parker would even consider paying you a slot for a slot then you'd have to do another two three years and completely destroy his club was like people loved you before they make you a host or a headline act and now what's happened is because of all these clubs collapsing a lot of open, a lot of guys have just started doing stand up 2 years ago in lockdown and a lot of those guys i love and i see potential in them but they forget themselves so like i go there's a lot of that still where he's got potential but they fluke and they brought mm. fun six and they da da da, da. I just spent 40,000 rand renting this theater. That sound guy I'm paying, this mic I paid. You see who oh, there's 600 people, Alfred's making a fortune. You not even counting the fact that I flew myself here. I organized the show. I paid the rental 40k. I paid it's huge amounts of money. I I also got this audience to come and pay attention to me. What in your world makes you think that I'm going to risk all that because you think you deserve it? You don't deserve it. You must come and do the work and show me that you are serious. You've done this for years. You're getting a consistently laughing because I'm not exposing my audience to you and uh, if you are going to upset them. Because mm. that's not what they're here for. If I put you I'm putting my name behind you. So that's now that's so with opening acts and stuff with comics I'm just using them as an example because that's the world I come from. I I implore them to always consider the fact that I'm not being or when they ask for to open I'm not being mean I'm just saying that you're not ready yet but they mustn't act entitled man a lot of people are they very entitled <laughs> there's a entitled. lot of entitlement as, as as easy as that put in the time do what you must do times, don't I mean, act entitled and be humble and maybe I dude know. I I open for I open for Mark I open for John I open for Joey I open for all these people right I knew when I got there I was on time bro these almost don't even rock up on time they want to get paid I never got paid for open spots ever I flew myself to Cape Town eh, to open I flew to I flew to open for Mark I called Mark I said Mark can I please open for you just say yes I'll get myself there He said yes come through and you know what a great opportunity it is to open for Mark just the experience of it just yeah. to rub shoulders with him I, I'm humbled by the fact that the man even knows my name I don't need money from him. I, you know what I mean? But when I get there, trust me, I'm going to do the job phenomenally. Comedy is the only place in the world where people think that they can just jump on and and open big shows. Oh no, I think there's a there's a few there's a few Probably industries is. like, like <laughs> I, I'm a graphic singers. designer. <laughs> yeah. I'm a graphic designer. So there's a guy, there's people in the industry that to one course i mean you but you <laughs> yeah. you do your own posters but you worked in it long enough to know no, the I, beauty I, of a posters pause so, ne let me just sorry to interrupt you my brother i also have people that tell me the truth brutally i made that unfit and fat you see that yeah. not the unfit and fat was done by scamp scamp and the mcnkp yeah nazir and them built that thing that is a professional you can see that's a okay. professional okay. thing right uh, uh, yasin bonds's wa- sister did the pictures yeah. scamp did it i paid them top dollar to do it okay because the previous <laughs> posters ek het mos nou self gemaak ek is mos nou <laughs> but bro i'm in australia <laughs> so listen, exactly what i was going to talk listen, about <laughs> listen, i'm in australia i paid the price though i'm in australia ek het so baie foute gevat in die ijsbeek ek vind die foute met die kopie in die huis hy listen to this my brother says this looks horrible i said no man i'm just doing it here because i'm now locked down where must i now go i'm just gonna do it go go do not ek dink nee ek dink like all right man ga dit nee that show is selling Anyway, my brother says next run you do a professional job. This is not good enough. And he's right. Yeah. Come we're walking in Sydney. Now lo and behold, the show is one of the fastest selling shows in Sydney. So what happens is they put you on what they call best of the fest. So they put up a billboard 
where they put up all the number one fast selling shows. Hier is hy foutere wat ek gevaar het aan my, hy is grasgroen. Hy het so groen tint. <laughs> On a billboard. Hy is so stikkie plank wat uitsteek in die foutere. <laughs> On a billboard. <laughs> so, uh, it yeah, was small on a, it, on, a, on, a, on a phone, you can't see it, nee, but why it goes? I can't see it, I can't see it, I can't see it, I can't see it, I can't move. And, 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 and yes, you're right, there's a lot of that, but finish, finish your thoughts. Sorry, <laughs> no, no, you, that, you, you explained exactly what it is. People pay the price. A surgeon you, doesn't. You, you think you, you're something bro. and you, you, you're not. Like Doctors, <laughs> Doctors don't have to deal with this, man. Brother that comes out of law school doesn't just walk into, <laughs> into a courtroom. <laughs> A uh, brother, does a doctor don't become a surgeon and cut out the spleen on day four? <laughs> these Owens, a lot of these guys, they, and they hate us for saying this, and they, they say we hate us and stuff, but I used to, I know the feeling. I also I still want to open for people. I was so, I, and it was also a time I wasn't ready. Really? And I was also, it's, it's right to, to have those ambitions, but it's also important to understand, to be humble and to sit back and go, but Elf, why is this comedian saying no to me? Is it because he doesn't like me? Or is it because I'm not ready? And then I always tell people. I mean, this is maybe because I'm not ready. I'm just I, not I, ready. I like this man doesn't like, it's not disliking me. I go, I remember Skumba, which is one of the biggest comics in the world, uh, in the country. You see, he said to me, Meh. one night he said, it's like you did it. Oh, it's okay. And it's like, how dare he? You know, you catch in your feelings. But I caught myself and go, wait, he was right. I was right. Also, another thing I go, when you're starting anything new, it's a gift, especially in comedy and in a creative space or the public space, it's a gift to be anonymous. Mm. There's a gift to it. That's told me this as well. It's a, absolutely. So I can't go out to the back of the theater. If I flop, it's a massive flop. But if you're anonymous, you get to, 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 to learn. It's, it's, if you oh, open spots are, or newcomers are often too in a hurry to make money or to become famous. You, you're in the wrong business for that. What you need to do is hone in on your craft and do it well. The rest comes. If you, if, if I see Joe killing and I see him killing again and like doing really well on stages, if you, you become undeniable, mm. I'm going to call you. Trust me. I know how to get your phone number. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just this thing where people must just be patient and and take this time, Luisa Madinga. I'm sorry, I'm talking so much. No, I'm talking. Oh, that's what the podcast is about. So, so, so Luisa Madinga is a very popular, very, very good comedian. Yeah. And we started about the same time. And back then, my, my mindset was very competitive. And I was like, I want to be Trevor Noah in two years. You know that. You're still a little bit competitive. No, I'm not a little. I'm very competitive. Still now. You need, you need that Competitive though. till the wheels come off. <laughs> um, so I go, and it's good, man. It keeps me, keeps me anxious. Yeah, keeps me going. Same with me. So I go, I, I, I look at this thing and I go, okay, Madinga. Now that time they used to have a lot of comedy competitions. The landscape was different. There was different, there was a lot of comedy clubs. There was still a lot of money being, Nando's was pushing money into comedy. Um, uh, Savannah was pushing money. There was a lot of comedy money being pushed in. So we would go through these open spots and open spot competitions. Mm. So I think like six months in, me, I'm still green, bro. I'm doing well. I'm cl- I, I can feel where I sit in the landscape. I'm in the top group of newcomers. How so many I, months in? Six. It's about six months in. Okay. So now six months of comedy is nothing. Uh, most people will tell you, I've been in this for 11, going on 12, 11 years. So I, most people will tell you I'm still a newcomer, okay. right? So I go. Yeah, six months is nothing. Like. Nothing, nothing. If you can still count how many gigs you've done, you've done nothing. So now I go, cool, this bra's in this competition with me. And he was good, man. And so we'd be in competitions and he would win those things. One after the next. I'd be second in everything. I couldn't forget the thing. I got a nerd rock on my mag, man. How can this man be so vain, man? I'm funnier than him. It's because there's a bias in the room. There's a bias. It's because he's pink. You know what I mean? So uh, you find reasons. Your ego finds reasons to, to, to not look at yourself, you know? Uh. The truth is I wasn't ready. Loisima Ding is one of my very good friends. He's the greatest gift that I got out of comedy early on because he won everything and his career catapulted to a place where you will tell you he wasn't ready for it to be. 
So the bra goes from open spot. Next week is opening the Nando's Comedy Showcase with David Cow and international acts like that bra from Drumline. And yeah. Now this bra standing in front of 2,000 people in a theater. He only has five minutes. Sure. And now he's popular. And this five minutes is good. And they're plucking him in everywhere. Madinka is very clever, very conscious, very smart guy. He went and went, let's pause and started saying no to these opportunities. Because he said he knew that if it, he only had this five minutes, they would start seeing him because he would only be doing this five minutes. And eventually Everything. he's going to be a one trick pony and people will move on and his career will be left behind. So he withdrew. But I don't know if I would have had that self-discipline that he's got. I would have just taken everything and who knows what would have happened. I'd probably still been in marketing because I would have burned out early. I and don't think you had that personality, man. I think no. you got more of a sink or swim personality. You just mentioned something uh, 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 with COVID. Like so Some people are just built differently, man. Um, I, I watch a lot of MMA fights and stuff mm. like that. Like, and it's just, uh, sometimes it's almost like an analogy for life inside fights. Mm. Sometimes you can be losing the fight all the time and right at the end, yeah. you can kick in and you but win. But I don't give up. <laughs> win that. The same thing, like there's a, there's a fighting spirit within mm. you. Like mm. I can, you can see it like, nah, okay, this is not going to work. Okay, now what else do I do? Let me go this way. Mm. Well, you can, and, uh, and, yeah, and it's just in, within some, some people and it's, what, within, it's not in other people, fighting mm. spirit. Or you can learn or things can happen to you in your life and you can almost like get this fighting spirit, like mm. not the shit happened to you and you overcome that and you learn a fighting spirit. I, you know what, weirdly enough, <coughs> you, you mentioned that I'm going to tell you things that are also like interest, like people don't know about me. I'm a huge fan of watching mixed martial arts. It's dope. Love it. I, I watched it. It's an energy for life. <laughs> Dude, I wanna, I'm going to start taking up jujitsu. I know they're going to roll me. I'm going to love cuss. it. I'm going to be cussed. Where, 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 where do you live? Do you live close to Sunningdale? Eh? Do you live close to Sunningdale? In Joburg? Uh. I live close to four ways. Okay, but. There's the a Gracie Jiu Jitsu there. Okay, the uh, Gracie's are good. But the best in, 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 uh, in Johannesburg is uh, Richie Kwan. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go to uh, Richie uh, Kwan. Oh, 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 Keng Manra was there. Okay. He's the best. Now He's I'm going to find that out. Oh, but oh I, fine, I, Richie. I'm Richie, probably Richie's gonna, the best. I'm probably going to vomit, but okay. <laughs> no, I you watch will. You will, but you'll enjoy it. A ton of that stuff. And the weird things that my wife always says, people don't know you, bruh. I watch a ton <laughs> of stuff. I know a little bit about a lot of things. I can tell you about jiu-jitsu. Yeah. I can tell you about camera gear. I can tell you about weapons. <laughs> For some reason, I watch a ton. Watches. Uh, it's this weird thing about me. But... Now, what I was trying to get at with, with him is this, that anonymous thing. He, he allowed me a space to, to, to he, 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 he took that shadow of his, allowed me to develop beautifully here in the background, not, and starting to realize that the competitions don't matter. Yeah. And this don't matter. And let me just keep on doing the shows. And then I started really developing nicely because my competitive nature would have gotten in a way, in a way, because yeah. you can't be competitive about art. You know, it's also got to grow I I organically. I always make sure that the things I can control, I control. Like being here on time, I'll be on time. Those yeah. are the things I can control. But in art, there's things that you can't control. Mm -hmm. And he allowed me that, that anonymous time to develop. Nay, bro, when I became, so I was here in the background the whole time. So when the moments came for me, five, three, four, five, six years, 10 years later, now I don't sweat it. I go, I've been in a smoky room in, in Boxburg, been thrown with a bottle. <laughs> I've died in front of aunties at the at the at the, at the like a fundraiser. I've 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 done smoky clubs. I've been robbed from my money. I've 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 had load shedding shows. I've done it all. I know every combination of this thing, and that is only because I was anonymous at the time. So the stakes weren't that high. I can't risk those things now. I can't go out like a random night when I walk into a stage. It's very, it's becoming increasingly difficult to walk into any old room in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. They know who I am. I see it in their eyes. I yeah. go, they expect more. They don't give me as much time to develop new stuff. Because they know you. They, know. they go, it's <laughs> Alfred, it's going to be rock and roll. <laughs> and then you've got to sort of give them so it makes you it makes you go cool i need to give them old stuff yeah so that they're happy and then i need to work in the new stuff but yeah i was gonna I mention like uh uh tats told me the same thing like um we were speaking about like uh he said like um i told him i got the podcast this was like maybe before lockdown 
yeah, just before lockdown, I told him I had the podcast and uh, I've been chatting to people. Mm. And so I've been, we've been doing this for four, between four, four, four five years between mm. the two of us here. Uh, but obviously we were doing things behind the scenes. We were researching sound, doing yeah. all those, because we never, four, five years ago, nobody knew nothing about podcasting. It was no an American thing. Yeah. So sound, video, all that, we taught ourselves, analytics, yeah. Google, yeah. everything, how you put everything together. Mm. But yeah, I, I got, that's and I told him like yo I got the podcast when you come on like and he told me like like you did obviously huh? I'm a nobody <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's, that's. <laughs> he told me like that huh? and I'm like and he told me like you know what the best thing for you to do is like stay anonymous get good at conversation or or, or podcasting yeah. and then yeah. like come yeah. approach me again yeah. and I thought I was just, like, that's yo, great this advice brother, like a whatever yeah and I walked away but there's so much conversations that I've had since then. Yeah, that's made me better at conversation, yeah. and I can imagine just me in in, in this room. It's like where things like go horribly wrong mm. in conversation. People don't misunderstand. Start it's, arguing it's, with each other. Yeah, it's, or just <laughs> yeah. or just it's, it's just not good it's, content. It's yeah. just like we're talking cack. Like now there was there was there was ebbs and flows to this conversation, yeah. highs and lows. Yeah. That is the the. Art You've learned a lot. Yeah, you, yeah. you learned a lot in those days. Yeah, I mean, it's great advice. Tats can come across like that a lot, but he has say advice sometimes yeah it's dope but it's dope yeah, yeah. now i feel better at conversation yeah. and now i feel comfortable this is a skill, talking eh? to 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 you for i think we're almost going for the longest podcast that we ever Probably, had two I hours, speak, hours. <laughs> um also like I, people look at joe rogan and they go ah, biggest podcast ah, he just talked no bro that man is great at what he does it's, it's also awesome. a thousand two thousand podcasts there or ten thousand who knows because the brothers two a day five days in a row i go you're gonna get better at it. You know what I mean? And so you, you're right. I mean, I can feel when someone is better at it. I do these things, you know, yeah. like I go like, I know when someone knows how to let people speak and- Yeah, don't talk over the next person. They're so important. Like Take it a different direction. So like. so Mario does like the, 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 the online thing, which is an mm. hour. Yes. And it was an opportunity for me to do that. But then I was like, no, mm. that's not who I am. No. Like I need to talk to somebody in person. I need mm. to feel the energy. Uh-huh. Number one, I need to have that be ability. And it's like on the thing is then like, ah, ah, what, what did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like that. I need the, I the cleanliness of the, of the conversation. The professionalism, the cleanliness, the, the energy. You're hundred percent right. Yeah. There, there's something that goes missing on those. I mean, everyone tried it. I mean, Fat Joe's got that thing also where like, like Ma- uh, Mario did well with it. But I go, there's so many things that can go wrong there. And it's live. You know what I mean? Like, why not just chill? Let's, let's, and then cut it up in clips and do the things and whatever. But yeah, you're right. 100% right. Yeah. But anyway, man, yo, we've been talking for two hours. Thanks, I, I, I said I was only going to keep you for an hour. I but don't mind, man. I, I took the day for you. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, I've got the day. I'm what good. What are you doing for the rest of the day? I'm probably going to go back, find someone to have lunch with or whatever. And then that'll uh, okay. be We're at the hotel. hotel. I am, yes, I'm at a hotel. But I've been in so many hotels this week, bro. I come from Joburg. I drove to George, stayed in the hotel there, went back to, went, flew to Cape Town, did a gig, came back to George. Now, these are all, I'm not complaining. These are great problems <laughs> I've got. Went to Port Elizabeth to see my, uh, to Hanky to see my parents for two days, drove to Sagefield, did two shows in Sagefield. Those shows were very good for me because they, those audiences were honest. Like, they made me work. You know, so yes. after that two shows, I rewrote some of the stuff. Then I went to Marcel Bay, fantastic night. But again, bigger audiences. And then from there, I drove to Cape Town. And then I'm here for two days just to kill some time and just to edit some stuff. And then, because I'm doing the marketing for the Baxter and for all the other shows. And then from here, I go to Paul. I'm there from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. And then I drive from there. My family comes in on the 13th, so they're with me then. And I go to Paternoster, I do the show at Paternoster. The next day I do a matinee in Paternoster. The evening I've got my very good friend's birthday, he's turning 40. And then the next day I'm back at Paul. And then I come here, Monday I set up at the Baxter. For the truck, big hole. The trucks come in because those the shows are big. So we're bringing in a set. We've got a set designer. Yay! Yeah, bro. You, oh, you spend this is like the most money you're spending on a on a show, like no, it's a, not the most money, but I spend a, a ch- fair chunk of money on the, the lyric theater. Money. You spend the so quite a bit. Uh, I spend. I like, and I tell people realistically when what they seeing there is they go, yo, that's bra. Cameras, blah blah blah. Those cameras cost about 150k 
and the, it's 150,000 rand just for the camera gear and the, and the, the staff that shoot those shows. So you film in it? No, those ones I filmed. Oh, okay. I've already filmed it. So that, that's the old show that, that that's going to go out. I just sold it to a broadcaster. We're going to make a big announcement. So Are you going to film this one? No. Yeah. Listen, it depends on how it feels in a year. I'm going to do the show for a year and a half first. You're going to do the show for a year and a half? I thought you like, by the time you come to, like, you're going to do it till December. By the time you come to the end of the no. show in, 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 in Cape Town. You no, got like just a- the show is green, is new. Yes. So I've, I'm gonna. I, I just started doing it. I did two nights in Centurion. All those nights I just mentioned. Then I go do the Baxter, which is gonna be a solid because I need to. I, I need a time under my belt. So I've done this show for 14, 15 hours. So I go before I get to the Baxter. I need to do it as many times as possible. So the show was competent already. Now it's just getting better. Then I do the Baxter run. Then I go and then I'll do Pretoria. Then I'm gonna do Port Elizabeth for. Then I'll do. Um, Australia, then I'll do London, then I'll do okay. Bloemfontein, Kimberley. Um, I see I'm doing Uppington, Shoo. Durban, I'm doing um, Namibia, I'm doing the USA, which no one knows about yet, but I'm doing the USA. And I'm, so I'll tour it everywhere. By the time you watch the show, you must come to the show now and, then come, come. and then come, just tell me when you want to come, and then come to the show when I, when I do it near you oh yeah i'm doing stellenbosch in february i'll do i'm coming back for wooster i'm doing malmesbury probably so I, I do it everywhere bro. i do it like the show gets run for a long time sometimes people come to the show three times <laughs> like doing those small places like malmesbury mm. uh, doing those different markets mm. it seems like different markets so let me put it that way mm. Cause it's like Cape Town to a Marmus, but it's totally mm. different totally. to a Durban to a Uppington is like, mm. oh, it's chalk and cheese. But um, does that make your, your set better? Because it makes like, you better. You're getting you different, better. you're hearing what, what different parts of the joke, different people laugh yeah, at. Yeah, and uh, But listen, I'm also fortunate in the sense that those people all know who I am. They're all on the same page with me. It's not like they are discovering me. They know who I am. They know, and I say Natalie, I don't say, I'm, I don't have to describe my wife. You know, my wife is, no, I just go, you know Natalie, then I start laughing. So they know <laughs> what's going to come. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's that. So it's a one big community. The reason I do those little towns Little towns, big towns, wherever, is because I love to do it. <laughs> I like doing it. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 my wife. You like doing it? It's I just like doing it. Because of the people. I did it for 40 people the other day. I'll do it for 600 people a night at the Baxter. I did it for 42 people here. Yeah. I'll do it for 15 people. I love doing it. And I tell people, <laughs> it's part of the secret. I'll do it for free, but I don't have to. But I, you know what I mean? But as you get in bed, it's like practicing. It's like, it's, it's, like, n- it's that, yeah. But I mean, listen, bro, the show is, is pretty solid already. I go, I'm not gonna, people are gonna get a great time. So I go, but I like to do it. I love it. I, I listen, as many times as I can do it, I'll do it. So that's my thing. I, I go around the country. It's not even, I, I, Natalie, Natalie looks at my books and stuff. Like I know my finances, but <laughs> She calls and goes, you know you, why are you doing this and doing that? And you know we're okay for this, man. I'm like, oh, I know, but I smart to go to. <laughs> nah, it's liquor. I smart There's to nobody go. else doing it like, I like you doing it. I smart to go to Gravri I mean, yeah. like, let's go to Gravri I have the first comedy show in Gravri ever. We had a great time. You know, like it's. it's You've been relentless. Thing. I like it. It's, yes. being, it's so it easy to be relentless when you like to do it. It's like, it's like telling my lighty, oh, he's a relentless at eating chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it's, it's easy. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's the, the, the relentless. It's like you sit in yourself. I don't know another comic that's doing as much markets that, that, that you're doing. Maybe there is. I mm. don't think so. But it seems like you're putting yourself so far ahead of the pack that nobody can catch up to you. And when they do catch up to you, it's like, okay, let's do this. this. It's fun. It's, it's good. It's a lot of fun. It's I like, it's like watching, this. it's like MMA. There's one brother, the style bender, he's so far ahead of the yeah. pack, kicking everybody in his yeah. chops. But yeah. one day there's going to be somebody, somebody that's going to take style bender out. But yeah. he must be, whatever, he, I would like that person to have learned from what you did and get better at it so that when they go to other markets, they show a, a good thing. Like I, that. I, 
I also like that my friends are doing things. Like, like we were in, I was in London. I sold out in London. Stuart called. He said, listen, what's that theater you called in London? I said, no, bro, I'm going to call this. I'm going to speak. Him. Then yeah. now he's in that theater. Now, now what's happening is, is that here are these South Africans. Are, something there is funny. So it's more and more Trevor. acts are getting booked. It's not just Trevor. Then I'm in Australia. They give me a phone call. They say, listen, bro, um, Scott Besaid, no, do you know him? He wants to come to Australia. I go, book him, book him. Is fire. Now it's not just about me. It's also I. The reason I'm at Reed Valley Wine Estate is because Skulk put me up in Reed Valley Wine Estate. He vouched for me because they didn't know who I was. We're also working together. Stewart has opened countless doors. I I I did shows at the Nelson Mandela Bay because Stewart put me into it. Stewart was took me to Nelson Bay. It's not just me. Uh, like, you know, we're also working together at a higher level. We're all actually very close friends. We, That's good. Um, in in, in, in um, uh, the reason I did uh, Studio 42 in, in, in Sedgefield, because I wanted to do it in Sedgefield. Is, and, but the people don't know you, so they don't care who <laughs> you. Then Dalen make, made a call. Dalen says, listen, Alfred is great. Now nah, I can do this. So we're always Make-up. also sort of massaging and helping each other on. But the truth of the matter is, is that for me, this is the easiest thing. I, I used to do marketing. I was very good at it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that for a reason. I go, we, I come from a work ethic family. So it's not about you liking what you do. You work until you get a gold watch and die. You know, it's that attitude. It's like you work yourself to death. That was always the thing. So like my father worked himself to death. My granny worked herself to death. My mother is ridiculously hardworking, right? <laughs> it wasn't about the pleasure of the job. It's about the duty of it, right? So now I used to do marketing. I was very good at it because the honest truth is, is that I know how to do things against my will. I hated the job. I would go to the job with butterflies in my stomach, hate it. A grind. And now I have got the blessing of doing something that I would do for nothing for free. Okay, I leave nothing, nothing to chance because I want this thing to last for as long as possible because I remember going to a job I hate. This job, I love doing this job. You know what I get to do now? I spoke to you for, I had the best time here. <laughs> I'm gonna buy, speak to another bro. My life is unrealistic. It's, it's such a crazy thing. My father always says, this is amazing, but I get to do what I love now and it's easier for me to work really hard at things I love. Like it's so easy. Yeah, it is. It's so easy, easy. To, compared to love doing now. Something. Now take that, take that. I will do that. I will work at that level at something I hate, and then add something I love to it. I love this. So I put the same work ethic into it. It's probably more. I never stop thinking about these shows. It's always I'm every day. My wife has to bring me back and go listen. Like this at the back, I wanted to bring in industrial size bubble machines. <laughs> <laughs> she tuned me. I said, "Wow, how much is that gonna cost?" I don't know, but I was like, "Bring the bubble." Imagine people sit down and the bubbles come. To- <laughs> you know, it's 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 because I I really am like a child now. It's like it's I get to I love it. You're not doing a Christmas show with us here, Lars. You, you had such an epic Christmas show. Yeah, so, we were like giving out. Was that it last year the year before? Ago. That show almost flopped. Yeah. I lost 150,000 right? But you gave people away so much things. I like. was in tears, lost all my money, everything. I just made it, saved enough money, put on this Christmas show, got sponsors in. Sponsors were giving every person in the show was going to get something. I, yeah, want, so I had this idea of having it like a Oprah Winfrey thing. Yeah. So we got like a Nura wine and Jacob's coffee. Everyone was going to get a big Jacob's coffee. If people paid 250 rand a ticket, but I was going to give them six to 700 rands worth of gifts. So after every joke I made to bring on a new act, I was going to go, by the way, Jacob's, I'll know. Savannah, everyone gets off. Like everyone was getting these packs that were pre-packed for the show, yeah. like six, eight packs. Then everyone was getting peanuts and chocolates and it was chaos. And then on two nights before the president locked the country down, then I'm sitting with all, I, I sat in a rental house with garages full of half of the stock because they didn't drop everything yet. So I had to refund everybody the money. And then I spoke to the sponsors. I said, listen, can I, can I please keep the stuff? They said, no problem. Just give it to the people. I said, yeah, I want to give it to the people. So I said, everyone gets your money back. Because there's always an opportunity in these horrible things. Because mm. I go like, we, me and Natalie packed those things. 
And then we went to like a, a park and we said, listen, first come, first serve. The first, whatever, 200 people, we have like stock for 200 people because the show was going to be like 600 people. So the first 200 people that can make it. And, that, and then we just gave that stuff away. But I went home three days before Christmas, canceled as much as I could, took a beating. Like I took a beating. We had a very quiet Christmas. It was January, February. As next held with Uncle, I was basically lost 150,000 rand. Just came out here and lost it. Like imagine you come out. People don't see all those. Yeah, lose it all. People don't see those lose. big knocks. Now you're selling out shows, but yeah, people don't remember the time that you uh, refunded everybody their money. Refunded and, and lost money. And you know, I mean, maybe you, you could have like kept some money and said, no, okay. we only refund in half because of we paid for the stuff and like that. The, but because you didn't, uh, that just shows the character of who you no, really bro, are. You know what I mean? Can I do not mention it? The reality of it is I had somebody call me from the t t ticketing people, all the ticketing houses, people. Like I've got friends that work there. They go, bro. Everyone was canceling. Bands were not giving money back because there's a clause in there that yeah. says no refund policy. Or is it the fifty percent or something? No, some of those things. I actually my tickets were non-refundable tickets. So so you imagine, didn't have to. I must give. I must tell <laughs> an auntie that's been two fifty. I'm not giving her money back. But you must gonna give her back. James <laughs> Mao. <laughs> you gonna give her a Christmas. Some pack of like them <laughs> didn't want the money back. Extra help terug. Um, a lot of people, uh, some people really didn't take it, but I ended up um, spending 150. Yeah. But listen, we came back and yeah. it was, we, and I think because we did that, we did well the next year. The following year you sold like, and now again, Man. you're selling like. Uh, I, I've sold more tickets this year than I've ever sold in my life. But people, people, uh, I don't know, people, people like you and it. I thought, I honestly, they see every the time, genuine people. My bro, every time I come here, I'll cry. Every time I come here, I go, maybe they're over me. You know, like there's always that thing. Nah. I go, why? I go, so like the Baxter initially said, listen, Alfred, we think you can sell three weeks. I said, <laughs> you mal, that's a lot of tickets. I said, let's do a week. And then I'll take a week. And then obviously they give the, 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 the other dates away and whatever. I said, I'll do a week because that's more tickets than I did last year. And it's ambitious. And now we've sold those tickets. So now, now we, we sold those tickets and we extended another two nights. So like, but I drive up here, I go, hey, how do you tickets? I tell Natalie the announce. There's a lot of insecurity. <laughs> because you don't know, bruh. You don't really know until people come on the night. Then I go, yeah, yeah, yeah let's see so. You know what I mean? I also don't count my money. I always tell people, don't count your money. So you count your money, then you take a knock for 150. <laughs> Check it out, I want to ask you, uh, <laughs> must you close up. do the people like it even more when, when Natalie and your family way is better, there? Way better. But how's that? Like she's become a star of the show. <laughs> Natalie, Natalie's a huge star. I'm just there by association. My wife just wants to know, but is Natalie, is Natalie also gonna be there. It's like, she's and like, she's like sells off the tickets. Is, so. Yeah, no, she sells the tickets. So, so let me tell you the statistics. Like before Natalie came into the thing, it was doing well. And then in lockdown, I was like, there's no audience here, man. I must tell a joke and there's no response. I'm gonna bring her into this stuff. I'm gonna ask her then it, whether it's negative or not. Listen, Natalie does nothing technically. Like, so I have to come up with a joke and I tell it, I record it, I send it out. Natalie just laughs or is angry. But when I put Natalie into a video, the ticket sells 30, uh, the, the video, the video does 30% better than just me in it. Every time. As everybody's wives, bruh. If, if the wives, because the, the wives wife can see, connect see and death. females buy tickets. They drive the ticket sales. Many times when I go out, I had a joke last year where I go, Liz, bro, I don't know who I am. I must need tickets go up. And then it's the all laugh because it's true. That bro, get the visa kid. He's just there because the wife said, we must go. And also because those wives see themselves in Natalie. Yeah. And Natalie doesn't fake it. And she is my who she is. And also she's Cape Townian as hell. So I think that that's also a big oh, part. The accent also comes and through. Like, says, like, ah, my wife doesn't fake jacks. She don't like, she, you will know she don't like you. She, she <laughs> don't make bones about it. So I think a lot of that stuff, no, Natalie, but the number one hitter, if I want, a, and I don't do it because I'm trying to take him out of it. Ethan. If I put Ethan in a video, mm. ceiling to, bah, yeah. times 10. Because like people, but I found that like, you know, people know us now. We, um, Natalie can't walk through a, in Cape Town, 
in Cape Town, it's the best because sometimes I, we mess around because we, we enjoy it too. <laughs> you said, like the lives. I, know, <laughs> I drove by. <laughs> one, day, one day we were coming from Stellenbosch, like we were looking for venues. I think like, I think like a Christmas show. I say, let's buy into Canal Walk because I know it's going to be Malini. Dude, we walked in the canal, walked some bra on the other side. I just said, Mama, make a bus cut. <laughs> it's so liquor. It's liquor, man. Like that, listen, now Natalie is very popular. I'm just here for the ride. I think, I think it's that, 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 that husband wife type dynamic. of thing, that yeah. dynamic. That is just like, had you just been Alfie, like mm-hmm. my wife would have been, okay, this bra is making whatever jokes again. But mm. because. It's about that family life, and she sees uh, this. Uh, oh, and plus, Natalie's, uh, what is her late, latest outfit that she's got uh, on? It's like all part of the whole. All part of the thing. Uh, and uh, and the parents fear. and her mother comes, and uh, my parents come, and it's the same old drama. It's like, this Christmas was going to be interesting on the vlogs and stuff, because is my parents are here to come to the show. My Bali is there, standing in. And so they become characters, my bro. My yeah, they, oh, oh, <laughs> I enjoyed the video with you, your dad and your mom. Like, yeah, I was listening my to Bali the can't walk, he loves it. He goes, well, you must see, we can't walk through the boulders. <laughs> People know us, aisle six. I'll say, I'm not a truffle hand core, but my cake no demands about food. He's hey, loving it up, huh? Love it, yeah, but they were scared in the beginning. Eh? You tell my parents, you ask my, my father said it last night. He said, who would have thought? Because in the beginning, when we were just, start, when I was just starting out, I was like making no money. I was doing well, but I was making no money, like from comedy. I, I was still having my day job. And he was so nervous. He said, listen, boy, don't leave your day job. Don't leave your day job. The day I said I'm left my day job, I was in Sustolta. Because I must remember these people broke their backs to get me an education. And yeah, I'm going, um, to gaan kak praat. you know what I mean? It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. like a, such a different, and then it works out. And so now, I mean, they were very supportive, but it, I mean, you can imagine. It's a big risk. It's a like, big but, job. But you said you Another yeah. lighty. He's got a lighty. He's got a lighty, this Ochi. <laughs> You know, but okay, I was out of, I was professional comedian when my kid was around, I was already all right. You said there was an overlap between work and, and comedy. So About obviously I under, well, understand that part of it. But I mean, the, even though, even that, that once you made that jump, like a lot of people, other people make jumps and like. It don't it, work. It don't work, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah no, listen, it's not, I tell people this Instagram thing is lies. I said, don't listen, stop listening to these guys that say just jump it's not necessary to jump be practical if you can do this podcast in the evenings if you and still have a day job keep that day job for as long as possible i kept my i was making more money out of stand up than i was making in my day job at one point and i kept my job for another two years after how many years did you make more in stand up than in your day job about three and a half that is very rare in comedy. It's very rare. It's very rare. Very, very rare. But I was, That's I was like in a one in a, one in like no, a thousand. Well, one, in a, one in a I thousand. Don't, I don't know anybody else that's done it. No, I've, I know. In God. South Africa. Jason and them just done it. The Goliaths did that. Quickly, bro. But Quickly. they opened a club Trevor. though. No, before, way before the club came. Okay. When we started, we started around the same time. We're very good friends. Uh, they used to, uh, their sister used to manage me. Mm-hmm. back in the day we're still very 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 friendly um we're very supportive they come to all my stuff um we started it was corporates you get corporates and what we were good at because we came from the world of business is pitching those corporates mm. so jason is a beast at that donovan is they they sent to 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 dominance was ridiculous and then I was part of that little ride here in the back, but I didn't, I wasn't interested so much in the corporate stuff. I was just more interested in doing stand up. Mm. And um, they were, you no, know, Jason had gone and made great money. If you hear, if you I always go like Jason and them quickly. So for me, the first three years was all about developing a skill set. I think I got my first corporate like a year and a half, or two years in. Then people started. Listen, they go through waves where they go, can we get, can we get Joey, Riyadh, whoever, right? But those guys are obviously expensive. They are They're not cheap. Thought. The big guys, right? And, and rightfully so. Then I became that guy that just would destroy at a corporate. Clean, know exactly what they want because I used to book comics. Just, and then 
say for example you take your wife to a year in function she works at another company i come in they destroy now she goes yeah that bra i'd have business cards that bra was amazing then they booked me for that one so it was word of mouth that used to get me yeah. around my word of mouth was so strong after a while that i was killing corporates i was having to tell uh, there was a day when my boss called me in and said alfred you great we lining you up to be the md here. we want to send you to 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 live and work in the usa but we were driving past billboards with your face on we know you, you you're taking sick you're taking sick leave and we don't know if it's legit It was like that. So I was like, listen, I looked him straight now. I said, bro, I'm done. I don't want those US jobs. I'm okay. Then he said, he, he said, close the door. He said to me, listen, lucky for me, I'm very good friends with him. He said, listen, yeah, sometimes you got to break eggs to make an omelet. Don't tell him I told you this, but tomorrow morning, just don't come in. Then I said, That's exactly what's happening. Because I had this big gig that I needed three months sabbatical for. <laughs> He said, there's no way I can do that. You're the head of marketing for Middle East and Africa. The company will lose money. I said, oh, I have to go. It starts tomorrow. Bra says to me, that thing? Then I go, okay, cool. He says, I'll try my best not for them not to sue you. That's where we were sitting. Because I'm the head of marketing for Middle East and Africa. My contract said, they did send me a letter. They sent me a letter to... Because I left my job abruptly. They sent me a letter, which is, I, I regret that to a degree. I wish I had. What, do you have a two-month uh, workout period? Uh, like a something? month, a month, a month, it was a month. But they, and I didn't prepare them. Normally you prepare them. And, mm. they, and then they said, listen, but it was the beginning of the year, I remember, it was a Feb. Then I said, listen, I've got this gig that I was offered to go around the country to do a corporate. It was more money than I was going to make for the year, yeah. In two months. I go, guys, give me the three months sabbatical. Yo, yo, they go, yo. nah, nah. I go, listen, I'm going to have to leave. He goes, yeah, okay, well. Listen, then he says this whole thing we want to. They were offering me all kinds of things. Every time I was wanting to leave, they were offering me better things. So then I went, okay, cool. I clearly, when this bra said, you can go, I've never told the story. When this bra said, this is the thing about podcasts. You speak to a bra long enough, he'll tell you the truth. <laughs> um, Uh, eventually they said to me, listen, we want you to move to, <laughs> that wasn't an attractive thing. It was to move to Detroit because one of the officers were there and they wanted me to run the marketing team out of there. So they like, were just trying to keep you. <laughs> they, were trying, they, they offered me to pay for my MBA. I was like, I'm making these jokes, man. I like this. Then the bra says to me, I couldn't tell my parents that either. I told them that. <laughs> then, I, <laughs> then I said to the bra, now I'm leaving. And then the next day, lucky for me, I, me and this boss of mine at the time had worked together at a different company as well. And we were very good friends. And then they sent me a, lot, a lawyer's letter to say that there'll be damages and they're going to sue me for damages. And then I think he intervened. And then I said, listen, guys, it's early in the year. I'll do everything I can remotely for you, but I'm not coming back. And so, yeah, that... And then a year later, they actually, I went back and said hi, and, you know, just smooth things over because I don't like to leave people with a vibe like that. But so we made money, like we started making money. It was good money in corporates and I was got passed on from company to company. But uh, that stopped, eh? I haven't, like this year, my corporates only started in October. So that's why I'm saying that people saved me because corporates, uh, companies don't do corporates anymore. People are getting retrenched left, yeah. right and center. There's no time to entertain, you know? So corporates have become a lot less. There's still guys like Jason and them still do very well at it, but it's not my core focus at all. I'm not here trying to do shows in Chobertina. I got a weird question. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's, let's take you back. Had you have taken that job off of that time, right? Mm. Mm. You would most likely probably been earning a lot more now. They... <laughs> Had you have taken that, you'd be earning a lot more money than what you're earning now or what you're coming home with now. I, I'm going to answer that like this. Because uh, maybe you, you would have been a CEO by now. <laughs> I, listen, I was pretty, I was pretty you would senior. Have, you would I have was been pretty a CEO. senior, but... I had the same attitude. I, I think that I don't care. That's the difference. Uh. I just don't care. I don't care. I'm not interested in that money. That could have paid me a million rand a month. I would much rather look into her auntie's eyes while she's laughing. <laughs> That's what I wanted to get to you. It's like, uh, you chose your passion over... 100% because also I knew, else. I have a friend called, my best friend's name is Temba Ratsibe. 
one of my best friends. His name's Tim Baratsebe. He works for, he's, he's a general manager at one of the biggest brand companies, um, energy drink brand companies in the country. You can make a connection in your yeah. head. This guy, from the day we started working at L'Oreal, the first day, he was next to me. And this guy loved marketing. Now I loved certain parts of marketing, don't get me wrong. I loved it. I loved the creative part and the strategy, but I hated the pay. It's a lot of admin. It's just admin. Yeah. People think it's making posters. It's it's not that. <laughs> I don't even I don't even look at creative as the smallest part of my business. I'm looking at numbers. It's a numbers business. It's like what's the trends? Who's selling better? Why are they selling better? It's unpacking what's yeah. the next launch? What's in the pipeline? What's your share of voice? How, what, why are we not selling in the Eastern Cape? That kind of thing. Numbers. It's numbers. It's a numbers game. So at the highest level, it's a numbers game. At the uh, marketing jobs that really pay is numbers, not yep. creative. So, 100%. So now this guy next to me, this OT, would be there before me in the morning. He'd be there after me at night. He worked at that thing like I worked at comedy. That man <laughs> loves marketing, my bro. This man is, and I was working really hard. It's like racing a bra that He's got a pair of tackies on, you got a pair of jeans on and, and your backpack full of bricks. You know what I mean? Yeah. And trying to run at the same pace as him. His passion is so strong that I go, eventually Temba is going to be my boss because I can't outwork that passion. That's what comedy is to me. The reality is for me that the reason it's very difficult to top an Alfred Adrian show if you're competing with me. So because Alfred Adrian loves this stuff. He's like, I'm not even thinking of you when I'm doing this. I'm so happy to be here. You know what I mean? Like, so I was like, why would I stay in this marketing job? Uh, Eventually, you say I would have been paid more. I don't know. Would I I'm, just saying, I'm, I'm just trying yeah, to put maybe. it in the, the no, either the... You, say, uh, but <clears throat> it could have also just been one day I walked in and, and I flew up someone some more and leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I was just... It wasn't for me. Yeah. It wasn't for me. My my, <clears throat> many people you see that were that like they just it wasn't for me. It, I couldn't. I wasn't interested. Eh? I was earning good money and I was, all that. You learn there. People say like me. I was growing up middle class, working class. People. I was going. How can a brother be unhappy if he's making that kind of tom? Yeah, you get there. No, I, I understand that. It. It's like, and I find myself working a day job, but I also have passions. Uh, look, you, my, my passions is not going to, at, at the level that I am, my passions is not going to pay the bills for my family. But when I work my day job in a creative sense, I, no. I find um, happiness. I, I can bring all money. I have to then I have my passions, my jiu-jitsu, my mm. maybe stand-up comedy yeah. once in a while, my podcast in my research just just finding out more about what i want things about i, I would like to find out mm. and when i when i have that both i like have like peace absolutely you know what I mean? but when you don't have that passions that that when you lack that that, that, that that passions it's almost like you there's a hole there you yeah, try to fill it all up with stupid there's things things that don't money can't buy you yeah and 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 joy doing having pride and excited about your work is priceless. I have I have seen. I also tell people you can find ways to make good money out of passions. You know, I've got I've got <laughs> I've got a friend. His name's Martin. We went to school together. Rechter Fleischkop, like a <laughs> meathead, like just always kicking a rugby ball. You know, like bra finished school. We were all going to varsity. This bra said, "Nah, I'm gonna go work." Goes and works. Three years later, I bump into him. I'm still at varsity. His bra is driving a Z4. Immediately, I'm like, "Nah, the bra for quite early." <laughs> 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 that's all I could have thought about that. So I was never going to pay for the pearl moon visa. Except as he snore. Um, this dude says to me, "Listen, I started. He started working at like some sort of a beer car, beer like like a farm implementer, plus implementer like for farmers, like shovels and whatever. He sells it to them at bulk. Mm. And one of the big things was uh, these irrigation systems. When I could have had water, and with the tires that they just yeah, go, yeah, yeah, go on the f farm fields. And he was he was supplying those parts for the company he was working for as a rep. So he'd be driving his bucky in and out of those areas uh, all around the Eastern Cape. And then he figured out that there was parts on that irrigation system that was ridiculously expensive, and the farmers were constantly complaining because like uh, 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 this one part specifically was like twenty seven thousand rand every time, and it broke a lot. Then this oh goes on holiday with his girlfriend to China. True story. Oh comes back. He finds somebody there in China that can make this thing. 
he calls, he figures out how they can bring it into the country. I think he brings it in at like a fraction of the cost. I think it cost him like a thousand or thousand five hundred rand for a part that sells for twenty seven grand at the cheapest. So now he goes when he was scalping rapping on the side. He's going to this bra lesson. I know, but I can sell you this thing for fifteen k. Bra's going to give me two. He's making every time. He's making fourteen grand. He says it was two weeks he left his job. Then he just went to the same clients, and he still brings in only those things. The man is wealthy now. Word of mouth, also well, like bro. obviously, nah, nah. Why are you gonna get paid twenty seven hundred? Just go yeah, to that money, bra. <laughs> money comes, man. And I've I've got another bra that was a uh, that was very much into like plumbing and stuff, plumbing hutter, and we used to tease him. That's bra, he can move plumbing, and he know the jokes. <laughs> That bra has got like four buckies now. His wife's got a, he's got his wife in a in a in a holiday uh, at a beach house. Dude loves plumbing, you know. So like money isn't everything, it, but it's very it, money isn't everything, but it's a luxury only people can say when they are already settled. Okay, yeah. you know, if you, money money becomes everything when you don't have it. Yeah, man, I've got three three miles to feed there. Yeah, my bro, they can't bear and photos and posters. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't do jujitsu in the night and just exactly. and that and the, the next day. Find your passions, and maybe one day the after you grind enough, at the, something will open. Otherwise, you snap, bro. You snap one day because you are just doing what you hate. Yeah. And then one day you hear those stories. I have a, <laughs> I have yeah. a brother. His father worked at a spice company. That one day he just walked in and he locked. There was a glass window. You know those glass cubicles. Yeah. I and hello. I say it's hard for the boss. That's when you hate your. You tired and hate your job. And just the boss. The boss said something that he just didn't like. This is when people snap from doing things that there's no Mental. balance. There's no balance. But I lock the door. Everyone can see from the outside. He locked the brass door. You can see through to the boss's office. Miles and I cubicle too hustle. He put the key in his top pocket. And he dragged the boss over, <laughs> and he slammed over. <laughs> He's got fire for a, a, a assault. That's mental health. Yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> mental health. Snap. It's like if you don't like, and it's and and I'm I'm I think I'm lucky because I'm aware of this. But mm. there's a lot of other people out there that's not aware of it. No, it's like they doing something and they they just doing it, but they're not uh, not. Uh, they're not in their passions or mm. following their passions, and they trying to fill this hole with. Whatever they're trying to fill the hole, yeah, bro. and so yeah, so but so yeah, so. <laughs> we've been talking forever. Like. I don't even know. What has been three hours? It's been an awesome conversation. I never took so long on a podcast before. They come proud, bro. They come proud. Now I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you got Thanks to, for you took time to, to, to come, no, to come down. No, a pleasure. Listen, absolute pleasure. I'll come again. I enjoyed it. I had fun doing this, and I'll come back. And I, I want to say that I like what I see. Here. There's a lot happening. There's a lot happening behind the scenes. That people don't know, like we said earlier, it's a professional podcast, and I can't see this not working if you keep on doing this. So, and I implore people to come on. You must be a bigger fish. All those people that you, in your heart, ne, that you wanted to call, speak to your homies. Then I'll speak to them. You, if they give you drama, just let me know. Shop. Yeah, but th- thanks for coming on again. Yeah, man. Yo, yeah, this has been the a dope podcast. Please, guys, like, share. Subscribe, all of it. Um, check out the Alfred shows. Um, I'm no, I'm gonna go check it out. You got some shows at the Baxter, the 28th and the 29th. I think you got available still. Yeah, there's 29th, 28th, 29th. There's 50 tickets. I think left. Is it? Yeah, it's it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy to say that. It's wonderful. It's, it's crazy, a wonderful bro. thing. It always feels like pompous, but yeah, it's sold. No, you can have a little sold out. By the time this thing family. comes out, there'll be no tickets. Yes, yes. Nah, little man. But anyway, like, share, subscribe. Thank you. Peace. Bye. We out. Bye.